My name is Karen Barker and I'm Executive Manager and Head of the Government Projects at the Australia India Institute. And this workshop on soil and water management for food security is the second in our series of four workshops that we're running throughout the month of May as part of the Australia India Technical Exchange Program in Water and Food Security. And we're delighted to be partnering with the Australia India Water Centre for this workshop series. And before I go on, I'd just like to pause and take a moment to acknowledge the traditional owners of Australia. And just to note for those of you who are joining us from India, we make this acknowledgement of Australia's traditional owners in recognition of the ongoing and unbroken connection between Australia's first people and the land that we call Australia. So today I'm joining you at this event from the lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. And I pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging and extend my respects to any Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islanders here with us at this event today. I'd like to extend a very warm welcome to all of our distinguished speakers and all of you who are joining us this morning from India and this afternoon from Australia. And welcome back to those of you who joined us last week for our Groundwater Sustainability Workshop. These workshops are part of the activities of the Joint Working Group convened under the bilateral Australia-India Memorandum of Understanding on Water Resources Management. And that MOU is, aims to share policy and technical experiences between Australia and India. In India, it's led by the Ministry of Jal Shakti through the Central Water Commission and the National Hydrology Project. And in Australia, it's uh, led by the Department of Agriculture, Water and Environment. Um, we're also very grateful for the Department of Education, Skills and Employment, who is um, so also supporting these workshops and we appreciate the practical support that they give to boost research collaboration in the area, area of uh, water, soil and food security in particular. The Australian India Institute actually works really closely with the department to support education and research engagement between Australia and India. So we're delighted to be partnering um, uh, uh, with the Australia India Water Centre today to bring you these workshops. Um, the centre is a consortium of universities and research institutions in Australia and India. There's, I think, nine in Australia and 15 in India. And we're one of the members of the centre through our host university, which is the University of Melbourne. So the Australia India Water Centre um, remit is to address critical water security and sanitation challenges. And it's its work is to foster research, education and training and capacity building in all aspects of water in both countries. Um, in Australia, the centre is led by Western Sydney University and in India, it's led by the Indian Institute of Technology in Guwahati. And um, so it's in partnership with um, the Water Centre that we're hosting every Thursday in May, different workshops relating to key issues in water. And these workshops, are an opportunity to hear from researchers and water professionals about their knowledge and experience. And we want to give all of you an opportunity to think about collaborating with counterpart researchers in India or Australia and what you would like to collaborate on. And there'll be a chance for networking at the end of this session. Um, we hope you'll take up that opportunity. I also want to let you know about an initiative that the Institute has been working on with the Department of Education, Skills and Employment, and that's the Australia Researcher Cooperation Hub India, which is a virtual platform and it's designed to help researchers build relationships and share information and expertise um, and uh, with an idea of building up collaboration between our countries. And one of the key features of it is uh, we use it as a vehicle to promote funding opportunities and grants for researchers um, to support research collaboration. So that, that uh, website is now open for early access and I encourage you to explore the website and we'll be sharing a link in the chat so you can access it easily. Um, and do please check it out because we're going to be using it to promote some, some um, funding and other support for research collaboration, specifically around water in the coming months. Right, so we're now moving into the technical part of our workshop and I just wanna briefly run through the format with you. We're going to start with two 20 minute presentations and there'll be time for some short, short amount of time anyway for some questions afterwards. Then we're going to have some breakout room discussions 
And um, the final session will be an open forum where you'll get to ask your questions to the two presenters. And we're going to bring in two additional panelists as well to, um, to talk to us and you'll be able to ask your questions of them as well. And that will bring us to the formal close of the session, but then we're going to open some networking rooms for you to talk about your research. So I just want to um, finish off this bit of uh, reminding you about the objectives of today's workshop. So we're here to share expertise and experiences relating to soil and water management for food security. And we're going to hear from distinguished speakers, but we also want to hear from you. So in the spirit of openness, Please do share all your ideas and your case studies and your experiences, whether they're good or bad. It's all good lessons. We all we want to learn from each other. So please do speak up in the breakout rooms and in your questions. We also want these workshops to provide a setting where you can think about um, increasing your research collaboration with Australia or India. And we want to give you an opportunity to network. And as I said, at the end of this session, we're going to be opening up some networking rooms. We'll tell you about that later on in the session. Okay, so now I'd like to introduce our first presenter, Professor Brajesh Singh. Pro Professor Singh is Director of the Global Centre for Land-Based Innovation at Western Sydney University. And he's an internationally recognised expert in the field of functional ecology and soil biology. So his research into soil biodiversity has led to the development of new tools to improve farm productivity and environmental sustainability. And these tools include climate adaptation tools for agricultural industry, management solutions to increase soil organic matter, and also training for farmers and consultants and others for sustainable agriculture. So thank you, Professor Singh. We look forward to hearing from you about Integrating Soil Health for Sustainable Agriculture and Food Security. All right, thank you very much, Karen, for uh, introducing me. Um, I shouldn't take any more time and get on the presentation so I, I complete my presentation within the time frame I was given. Um, then the today presentations and given the time constraint we are working within it, I'm going to focus mainly on towards the concept side of things rather than giving you a lot of scientific evidence. Soil health, as you know, is a quite a big words and big uh, um, uh, terms in, in this encompasses all aspects of living being on the terrestrial life. So I'm going to, as I said, focus on the concept rather than the experimental or the scientific evidence side of things. It is important to remind ourselves why soil is important. Uh, human civilizations have risen and fallen on the quality of the soils, the fertility of soils. We have a lot of information from the Indus Valleys and the Mesopotamian civilizations that people, uh, those civilizations have started on the fertile land as the fertility declined, those civilizations collapsed or peoples moved from one place to other place. And for me, there is a no better uh, arguments that is made by anybody then uh, any politicians at least than the former USA president uh, Franklin D. Roosevelt, who said that the nation that destroyed its soils destroyed itself. And those are the facts because if you look at the human's requirements and what the soil provides, our most of the food, significantly, uh, I guess, uh, um, large quantity of our food, depending upon what um, models you use, up to 90% of our calorie intake still come from the soil crops and soil uh, producers. We're talking about today is the water. Um, soils plays an essential role for filtering and the buffering the water um, for the ground groundwater, and then through that to the stream water. It's a huge role to purify those waters and buffers and filters so that it can be reused. It have a huge role in climate regulations through the productions, but also the absorptions and mitigations of greenhouse gas in different form, for example, methane oxidations, carbon sequestration, and so on. What I'm going to argue today, that these soils functions they provide for the human being and in fact support the terrestrial life is mainly driven by the soil biota. So soil biota is a critical component. It, it, probably I'll argue the most important component of the soil health. 
I'm not telling anything new. This has been our human history. Cleopatra, the, the queen of the Egypt in BC, before the Christ's years started, declared that the earth was to be sacred in recognition of its contributions to the soil fertility. In fact, removal or killing of the earth was punishable by death because it was considered that it will offend the god of fertility and so you have a starvation and other things for the kingdoms to face. So I'm not telling you anything new that how important the soil bat are. So what are the, let's get back to the today walls, what are the challenges and why we need to go back to the, 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 the soil health and healthy soils? There's multiple challenges. I don't need to tell all of you that world population is increasing and consistently increasing. We will need seven to feed around 9 billion people by 2050. And that has to come from the shrinking arable lands because the land is shrinking because of the degradation. Uh, there's a vast amount of the, the, the lands, the arable lands particularly has been degraded. Where we see the green, in fact, are there where the agriculture productivity is uh, it, not used most of those for the agriculture productivity. So where we have been using agriculture, our lands aren't good. Um, so um, the land mass for the agriculture is reducing as, as we're uh, moving forward with the AS. The climate variability. And that will put another pressure on the soil degradations, but also the demand for the water, irrigation demands. We're talking today about water in the soil, how it is important. If the temperature isn't going to go up, plants will require more water for the, 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 the optimum amount of the productivity. And the third thing is that how the climate change is going to impact the pest and pathogen, we have no idea. And, and so that brings the uncertainty in, in the, food production as a result of food securities. The other aspect is the nutrient supply. Nitrogen we can synthesize and we can um, keep harming our environment, uh, environmental health. But phosphorus is a finished source. It's come from the rocks mining and it is expected to the peak by 2034. Whatever the outcome is after that, it will be more expensive. So more expensive phosphorus fertilizers is higher, um, higher price and that have a consequences for the food security and food productions. And there are multiple more drivers of going back to soil health that includes the policy requirements. I don't need to tell you that the European Union have just put what they call the Green Deal that requires a significant reductions in use of agrochemicals and increasing the soil biodiversity and so on. Consumer demands, people want more food that is grown sustainably and more healthy foods and so on. And if you look at what at all the analysis that has been done by multiple organizations across the globe, I've just taken some of them. This is done by FAO and, and some other scientific consortiums. There's two things that scans out that how are we going to increase the sustainable productions of the agriculture or farm productivity? Two things comes out on the top. One is increasing the soil health that can increase the productivity itself by 15 to 20%. And if we combine that the soil health with the new and more resource efficient varieties of the crop, then we can get to where at the at a minimum level where we need to be at 2050, which is around 50% of increase in productivity. So the soil's health is a critical component. If any scenario we look for the food securities, the soil health has to play a critical role in achieving those. But what is the soil health? And different people use it differently, it's different definitions. Um, one of my colleagues in Nottingham is probably is a, a lot of people will say him is the father of modern soil health uh, concept. Define soil health as a soil that is a constituted and managed in such a way as to be fit for the purpose. For example, if it is for agriculture, it should produce foods, healthy foods, and, and, and at, at, at optimum rate. If it is for the forestry, it should produce trees, it should produce carbon. So it is soils, which what is this for the purpose, it should do that purpose at the optimum level. I have slightly tweaked that definitions uh, from, the, from the agriculture point of view. So what I define is healthy soils are those that minimizes the annual variations in the farm productivity by provi providing resilience to biotic and abiotic stresses. For example, if you have a drought, if your soil is healthy, they should be able to buffer 
some of the impact of, of, of the drought or the pest pathogens because it's a, it's a healthy soil, it will be able to um, hold more water for the longer period of time. If it's healthy, it will resist more pathogen and pest attacks. All right, what's happened? Okay. Um, but the soil's health is is a not just um, is a is a abstract is a have a different component. I'm not going to go in detail. So the physical health, chemical health, and the, and the biological health, and this is that all come together. That's what determines the uh, proper health of the soils. Again, Carl defines as the five. It's Carl says there's a five pillars for the soil health, which is a soil biology. So the biota, the organisms that live in the soils, organic matter, water, the structures, and the nutrients. But it is not those pillars exist in isolations. Those pillars are interconnected and those pillars um, uh, influence each other. I'll give you some of the examples and particularly the structures in the biota that how they are interconnected. This is, they do not work in isolations. I talk about soil structure. One of the is fundamental to uh, is fundamental for the soil functioning soils because this provides um, a root uh, for the medium for the for the plant roots or the crop roots. It holds water for the uptake by the plants in the soil biota. It have all sort of other things. It provide habitat for the soil biota microbes and others. But soil structures, in fact, is a form by the soil biology, the soil biota. This is just an example in two, two layers, the soil structure, so the porosity of the soils, the aggregate stability of the soils, that is a function of the microbes that's that bind that on the top right, do you see there's a fungi, a, a fungus, that is a fungal, fungal mycelia, that is a binding the different particles of the soils into its structures. Obviously, there's clay soils on the top and sandy soils. As a result, you have a different pore size and different aggregate stability. But ultimately, the structure of the soils is also determined by the, the soil biota. And it's also true for the vice versa. And how that happens? Because there is an immense diversity of organisms lives under the soils, under our feet. 25% of global diversity is inside the soil, lives in the soil. Just to give you an example, like a one meter squares will have a hundreds of billions of the cells of bacteria and 50 uh, kilometers of the high of the fungi. As the organisms increases in the size from bacteria, fungi to earthworm ants, you see the number of species individuals decreases because that's how the food waves works. But these all organisms work together to contribute to as a key soil functions. So if you put, want to put into the human terms what the soil health looks like or what the interaction between the structure in the soil, it is an architecture. So the appropriate community living in a such an inner space of the parent material. So it can be the sandy soils or the clay soils or the loamy soils, but it is the organisms that lives in that space that's then ultimately decides the functioning of the ecosystem uh, ecosystems, including the soil functions and farm productivity. So what ultimately soil, healthy soil does, it provides appropriate structures to hold the water and the nutrients, the store organic matters, which then supports the biota for the nutrient cycling. It supports the biodiversity we just talked about in previous slides and reduce the impact of pathogens and pests and it resists the impact of abiotic stresses. For example, it holds water for longer, it can hold nutrients for longer, so reduces the leaching and draining. So what we are doing today, what are the tools today? I'm just giving a very brief summary. There is mainly we have management tools and that includes no or minimum pillage, no fallow. We shouldn't leave um, farm without a crop in it. The crop diversity in the intercropping, rotations and agility regensions, and appropriate use of inputs. So putting in the context, the sustainable farming practice is a critical building block of healthy soils. In the future, 
obviously there's a lot of technology and a lot of new approaches emerging. I just wanted to take a three examples for so that we can have a more discussions going forward today. So there's two things I'm going to talk about with the example is how we can ha better harness the natural issues and what are the emerging technology. Precision agricultures is improving every day as our ability of the artificial uh, or our artificial intelligence uh, ability is improving, the precision tools in agriculture is improving. If, if you look at the top of the slides, that's how you look in the slides if you look at the top left. But that isn't that. If you really look very closely, the soil have a huge variation in the water holding capacity, nutrients uh, holding capacities, the moisture and so forth and so forth. And as a result, because we're using all fields in the same way, the productivity is patchy, where you have healthy soils, more fertile soils, you have more productivity, where you have less fertile soils, you have less productivity. What the precision tools does, by combining the satellite tools, satellite imaginary, and mapping out where the soils need more fertilizer, soil needs more water, soil needs more other agrochemicals, the, and the release is according to the requirement. As a result, you have more uniform, higher productivity, and that's then ultimately leading to the high, total overall higher productivity of the systems, which also then contributes into the environmental health. The another technology that is, is improving is using, uh, so that we're going to use the fertilizer. At this moment, we go in through the, uh, the urea or the ammonium sulfate and other fertilizers. Most of them, as you know, 70% of them either goes into the water to pollute the ground and stream water, and some goes into the atmosphere to come the greenhouse gas emissions. The new tools that can be nanotechnology, that's in English polymer technology, what they are doing, and in fact, a lot of things is being filled trial at these moments, they hold those nitrogens, even in some cases, waters in the inside a, 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 a structures and releases only when, when the plant wood comes into contact. So you have a water in the, inside the uh, um, polymer, as soon as it comes into the plant contacts, it releases that, and so the plant can uptake. So that increases the water use efficiency, increasing the plant yield and, and availability. There's a third thing that is coming very importantly, that combining, as we talk about microbes, how important the microbes are, we did today did not have the chance really to talk about how the microbial technology is transforming the agriculture and will have a transformative state change impact in the next coming years. So it is looking at the, the, the how the local soils, crop varieties and microbes that interact in, uh, sorry, interact in, in a close contact, what you call the rhizosphere, which is a, the region immediately after the roots that will then determine the availability of nutrients and water and ultimately the plant health and the plant productivity. We want to end up though, at this moment, our system is quite leaky. We want to close loops. So the fertilizers we're putting in the systems needs to go back to the systems through the recycling of the West, uh, the animals and human waste, so that we capture most of the nutrients in, in a loop and not pollute the environments. And I will end with this slides is that the healthy soils is critical for the healthy plants, not only the amount of the productivity yields, but also the quality of the yields. And that then ultimately determines how healthy our societies and our peoples are. So thank you very much for your time. I appreciate that. Th thank you, Professor Prajesh Singh. Uh, really emphasizing the importance of soil health. And I think I like the last slide you showed, healthy soil, healthy people, and that's really true. And uh, I'd like to now invite uh, questions, comments from the uh, forum here. So really welcome anyone who has a question or comment on what Professor Singh has outlined. So while we are waiting, um, the soil health is really important. So soil and water go together. And the, the government of India has recognized the importance of soil. So now there is a campaign for the soil health card. Every farmer, every field uh, 
they want to know what the soil health is and then manage the crop water and so on accordingly. So from your experience in Australia, you've done a lot of work on soil aspects, soil health. Uh, what are the key lessons from your experience and that could be uh, transferable or something India can learn? I guess there's a two aspects. I guess that the farming practices are vastly different. Um, what, how we farm in Australia is how is farmers use the farms. So there's small holding and the, the pretty very industrialized uh, versus a very industrialized farming in Australia. But that does not mean that there is no uh, overlap to look into. So some of, some of the things that, uh, in fact, some level, it's Australian soils are more, a lot poorer than most of the Indian soils in terms of the fertility, what the farmers has done, have to learn to use the technology and the practices that still have, makes the soils productive. productive. So then one of the best example is 90%, 90, almost 93, 94% of grain farming in Australia is not tea. So there's no tea ledge. And, and, and so that's then had allowed the structures of the soils to build on over the period of time. And the other aspects is, I guess, the, so that's the one aspect I think that's transferable to, to, to look at. The other aspects that, that can be more easily implementable in India than in Australia is because of the small holding farms is like proper um, uh, crop diversity. You can, just because how we farm is still in most of part of India, I'm not talking about all part, all India, but most part of India is still a small holding farmers. They can use the crop diversity as an, an approach. And that solves two problems. One, the problem of the soil health uh, and contributes to the healthy and um, building the health in the soils, but also contributes to the, 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 the food and the diversity of the food for the, the farmers where they use these as a subsistence uh, farming. So there is a lot of things, water uh, huge efficiency in, uh, in Australian farming communities has just dramatically changed over the last 10 years, 15 years. That's another thing. India needs to learn as our groundwater, uh, as the groundwater in India is going down and down every day, um, every year. So that's another thing that I think those are the, the technologies that is available and transferable, and, and that should be, be the part of the conversations going forward. Thank you so much. Uh, we got a three questions uh, uh, in the chat box. So one is from Dr. Rajas Sekaran. Uh, would you like to speak uh, what you have mentioned in the uh, chat box, if he's still there? Yeah. Yes, please go ahead. Just uh, read your question from there. OK. Uh, oh, sorry, you're asking? Uh, to uh, Dr. Raja Sekharan. Okay. Thank you. Or I can read anyway. What are the challenges in scaling up soil micro biome used to improve soil health and crop productivity across pedoclimatic regions. Yeah, and I guess the sustainable practices um, works across the pedoclimatic regions. Uh, and there are, I guess, modifications needed. Um, if it is about, if the question is about how we're going to promote the soil microbial activities for the higher productions, um, it, it will depend on um, the farms and, the, and particularly if your soil is constrained of the nutrients, you need to supply the nutrients of the soil is a constraint of the carbon, you need to provide the carbon sources. Um, for example, the, the using some uh, organic inputs in, in the systems. So those are the things it, I guess, needs to be looked at. Climate sort of thing, oh, if the question is about the use of the microbial product, um, again, that's um, depends upon what we are trying to uh, use it. If it is a product that come from a particular regions and working in that particular regions, that can be used. But I guess the technology we are talking about at this moment is agronomic technology. So you are either using the crop, crop diversifications or the crop uh, or the crop residues keeping that's built with the microbial activity over the period of time. You minimizes the tillage. Uh, that's then provides the microbes to flourish over the period of time that's built the soil health of the times. So those are the commons that goes across the different um, part of uh, regions. But those, if you are talking about the inputs, then it depends upon the pedoclimate and you have to look into that aspects. Thank, thank you very much, uh, 
The next question is from Professor Prabhat Kumar Singh, and I can see Prabhat Ji here. So would you like to uh, ask question directly to Professor Singh? Uh, just, I mean, uh, I thought in Indian context, how we are going to close this nutrient loop in agriculture? That is what I just wanted to know. I guess ultimately, I guess it's about recycling. Um, so we use significant amount of nitrogen and, and uh, phosphorus. Those, you know, when we harvest, um, and I guess um, in here, I guess so there's a significant amount of residue remain in the soil. Um, I may be a bit um, <laughs> out of date. Uh, what I get from India, the most of the farmers still harvest everything, not just the, the grains, or, but, but also the straw for other purposes, or they burn them. And so what you are doing, you are taking out all those nutrients from, so you're mining the soils for the nutrients and organic matters. So, and then those goes into the humans and animals, whatever purpose are we using that product? It is about recycling those products back into the soil systems, either the waste management. Um, in Australia, we have been trialing a lot of things. For example, to give you examples, the, the West, uh, animal waste is uh, all, also used in India, so is that not common? Uh, uncommon, but, but the human waste, um, you, know, you can treat them, make them safer and bring them back into the agriculture practices systems. Uh, we have been try, uh, trialing uh, for a number of years, 10 years about collecting, uh, human peas, honestly, from the like big stadiums where a lot of people use the toilets. So you harvest the, all those um, urine uh, for the phosphorus and then bring them back into the farming system. So this is all, I'm not saying those all technology are there. There are, but the technology that has been, is being developed and trialed. And this is what we need to do is to make sure that, um, that we have enough recycling tools so that we can't, uh, uh, so that we don't have to keep adding and wasting the nutrients in the systems. Thank you. We'll, we'll just take a last question from Dr. Jai Pantaki. Uh, uh, Jai ji, are you there? Uh, yes, I am. Uh, uh, would you like to directly ask the question? Yeah, so I was just wondering what are some of the practical ways that smallholder farmers can improve soil health, considering you know they have many constraints, financial, cost of fertilizer, cost of inputs, et cetera. Thanks. It is about in incentivizing uh, those approaches. And, and I think second part is education. Um, this has been, uh, the Europe has been doing that over a period of times, few, few decades. And so those, uh, they gave farmers not to farm for a number of years. So they give some monetary benefits. Um, now they have brought even in the green deal even more incentives that if you your soil is healthy if you're building carbon if you're building soil biodiversity then the 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 the, the, the governments the european commissions um provide you the the the, the monetary benefits um the i guess that's the number one short of things um at i guess at the policy level that you have to incentivize and educate the farmers why it is important that that you build the farms over the period of time, this pays back. Uh, when you have a drought, you'll have more productivity than the on the farm next to you, to which have a less, uh, healthy soils. And third is uh, transferring those healthy soils to your next generations. From the technological point of view, again, we, we have to go back to the management tools. So the, if your soils is really poor, we use of the, the manures, the use of the, the compost over the period of time, uh, use of um, Keep the residue in the soils. So don't destroy them. Don't harvest them. Don't burn them. Keep the residue in the soil for a longer period of time. And um, so those are, I guess, are the critical things to put into, into the, 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 the tools we have at this moment is mainly the management tools and agronomic tools. That does not, um, and that does not mean that we will not have something in 20, 10, 15, 10, uh, 10 15 years. But at this moment is all management tools. And this is what we need to do uh, to encourage us to bring into the farms to increase the, the soil health. Okay, thank you so much. And I think uh, your presentation really uh, generated a lot of discussion and soil health will be important in the future without any doubt. So uh, thank you again. And uh, now we want to move to the next speaker. But before we do that, I uh, uh, can see Professor Kevin Dunn is here. So I request Karen 
uh, please welcome him and uh, he will give some speech. Thanks, Basil. Um, yes, uh, welcome to uh, Professor Kevin Dunn, who's Pro Vice Chancellor at the University of Western, uh, Western Sydney University. And as you know, Western Sydney University is um, the, the lead for the Australia India Water Centre. So we're really delighted to have you here, Kevin. So it'd be great to hear from you. Oh, well, thank you very much, uh, Karen. Um, I'm not sure if there's been a welcome to country, but I would just say Budjuri Mulanal Warami, which is to say, uh, good morning, although it's afternoon, I should say Budjuri Gamara Warami. In fact, good afternoon and welcome in the language of the Darug people. They're the traditional owners of the lands where I'm located today, where my office is, where I live too. And uh, it's a great uh, 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 gift that are these lands. Uh, the rivers and the lands, uh, two important resources as your workshop recognises and as this joint endeavour recognises, uh, they are a gift that we've inherited from the stewardships over millennia from the Darug peoples. And uh, we acknowledge them uh, for that gift. And if there are any Indigenous people present here today, uh, on behalf of Western Sydney, I offer my uh, cultural recognition and acknowledgement. And thank you for those gifts that are these lands. And I thank the, the, the Darug, but also the Gandangara and the Tharawal peoples for the support they give to Western Sydney uh, uh, and the work that we do uh, in Greater Western Sydney. Uh, and, I, I, and I acknowledge that these are Aboriginal lands that were yesterday, they will be tomorrow. Uh, thank you, Karen. Uh, on behalf of Western Sydney University, I know I haven't been here at the start today. I couldn't get the diary organised uh, to do that, but I was very eager to come along and to give a, a welcome on behalf of our university uh, to the Water and Food Security Workshop. Uh, I'd like to congratulate uh, all of our partners who are involved, the Australian Indonesia, uh, Australia India Institute, of course, the National Institute for Urban Affairs in India, IIT Kanpur, CSIRO, et cetera, the list goes on. Particular thanks to Karen, uh, the Executive Manager and Head of Government Projects uh, uh, for uh, MCing today as well. Uh, Western Sydney is very, very pleased to be co-leading the Australia India Water Centre with the Indian Institute of Technology. Uh, and on behalf uh, of the Indian universities and government agencies, it's, uh, it's a great, uh, great honour for us. The four workshops, as you know, been organised by the Australia India Water Centre and the Australia India uh, Institute is a great initiative to develop deep engagement between our two countries, between the water professionals and researchers and government agencies of our two countries. Um, uh, it's a great way to network, to know each other's expertise, develop joint research, um, uh, joint potential for education, capacity building initiatives in other ways as well, uh, because soil and river health are so vital uh, uh, to things like the Sustainable Development Goals. It may not surprise you that I might make reference to the Sustainable Development Goals and particularly the Times Higher Education Rankings. I'll say something more about that in a moment. But uh, forget about rankings. Sustainable Development Goals are so important uh, to the food security and livelihood of, for both of our countries. We need to understand, to better understand the health of those two natural resources, to monitor them, to develop uh, um, uh, the indicators for effective monitoring and management and ensure long-term sustainability is not jeopardized uh, through that. So, 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 so that's just so important. And uh, uh, Western's credentials though in this area are strong now. Uh, we're at the forefront of teaching and research on, 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 on sustainability. Very pleased to have our efforts recognized in the Times Higher Education Impact Rankings. Uh, 400 1,406 1, institutions this year in the rankings, the fourth rankings that they've done. We've done quite well in every year. We've participated fulsomely because we're very proud of our involvement in sustainable development goals and sustainability. Uh, but to be first in the world uh, was a, uh, is, is, is a great acknowledgement of our effort. And of course, as the Vice Chancellor has said recently in a letter to many of our partner institutions, universities around the world, uh, we, we, did, we can't do this sort of thing alone. Uh, we acknowledge our partners and our international networks in particular as sitting behind our success. Uh, so this is a great opportunity for all of us to shine, I think, in the, in, in the benefit of that outcome. But um, not just first overall, um, first worldwide in sustainable development goal number six for clean water and sanitation. That speaks to the issue of river health, of course. Uh, and, uh, and top 10 in the SDGs 14 and 15 for life below water and life on land. And our researchers, and you're hearing from some of them today, um, uh, are driving a lot of that work. One third or one quarter 
of the performance in any of these SDGs is, 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 is linked to our research. And we've got great scholars there. And it's great that we've connected with the scholars uh, elsewhere in the world, particularly in India. Um, the outcomes, no statistical error for us. We're very proud of it. We're not surprised by it. We think uh, we're proud of our work, not just our teaching and learning. We've got uh, organizational goals at this university that are important too. We want to make sure that our imprint on our environment is as limited as possible in terms of negative impacts, uh, third party effects, uh, whatever you like to call them. Um, but we have a target for 100% renewables by 2025. We intend to be carbon neutral as an organization by next year, uh, long ahead of the expectations uh, as set globally. Uh, that's next year for Western Sydney University, carbon neutral, 100% green and organic waste diversion by 2025, 60% use of non-potable water by 2025. Um, so that's how we intend to operate ourselves as well as an institution. Thank you, all of you, to the speakers, for the panel, Rajiv, Braj, Anu, Sasha, and Peter, and of course, our organizer for today, Basant uh, Maheshwari, fantastic program. Our thanks to the invite to come along. We strongly support this collaboration between Australia and India in the area of sustainable water for futures. And I wish you all great success in this workshop and in the collaboration that will follow it up. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kevin. And over to you, Kevin. <laughs> Thank you for me to Professor Dunn um, and also for your uh, wonderful reminder about the role of Australia's First Peoples in providing the water that we enjoy in Australia and for your support for the Australia India Water Centre and its important work. And um, it's great to hear about the efforts of Western Sydney University becoming carbon neutral. So um, yeah, terrific to hear all about that. Um, I'd now like to introduce our next speaker, um, Mr. Raji Ranjan Mishra. So Mr. Mishra is the Chief Advisor and Chairman of the Strategy and Policy Unit at the National Institute of Urban Affairs in India. And he's also the advisor for the Centre for Ganga River Basin Management and Studies at the Indian Institute of Technology in Kampur, IIT Kampur. He's the former Director General for the National Mission for Clean Ganga, um, recently retired from that, um, and during which he transformed the Namami Ganga program into an integrated multi-sectoral model framework for river rejuvenation in India. So um, we're really looking forward to hearing from you, Mr. Mishra, uh, on the Ganga, reimagining, re rejuvenating and reconnecting. Thank you so much, uh, Karen, and thank you, Professor Mahasturi and uh, the Professor Kevin. Excellent presentation so far, uh, and uh, very, very good presentation on soil health uh, by Professor Singh. In fact, uh, my presentation or my uh, sharing of my experience is more generic in nature. As you said, it's more about uh, rejuvenation of a river and river health. So it's perhaps uh, not so focused upon one particular topic, but of course, Sustainable agriculture is a very important part of um, uh, river health, and that's why that also figures uh, into that. So I have a brief uh, presentation. I will share the screen and um, is it good? Uh, uh, is my presentation visible? Yes, visible. Yes. Okay. Right. So. Uh, this is more on looking at the water ecosystem. Just now there was a discussion about SDGs and SDG 6 more on the water and sanitation, but uh, water perhaps uh, gets into several other SDG also. It connects several other SDG, whether it is uh, climate change or whether it is uh, uh, whether it is life over water or wetlands and several other things. So uh, I am basically trying to tell you about our experience about rejuvenating River Ganga. Ganga is national river of India and it's a massive uh, uh, challenge. So how we actually started basically talking about cleaning and got into several other areas, including sustainable agriculture, uh, improving ecology and flow. Initial attempt was, initial focus was more on the cleaning of the river, like uh, making of the STP, running of the STP and all that. Uh, it's also 
perhaps uh, the the experience of namami ganga is also an experience of in a developing world how we can take these kind of challenges where resource constraints are always there but uh, but if there is a kind of uh, a strong support from government and uh, good planning things can happen uh, there also and then uh, can it be also be a kind of uh, template for rejuvenating other rivers so i think that's the idea if you look at this uh, very quickly without getting into too much of detail i will tell you about um, uh, why ganga matters i think it's it's a massive river 2500 kilometer is direct river more than 100 towns are there on the river 4500 villages are on the river and a huge population is in this basin huge population this is also a very fertile agriculture land but agriculture is also very diverse here so i think we have the hilly area in a different kind of agriculture you have got genetic plain a very fertile plain and different kinds of agriculture is there you also have some upland areas in the basin where then it's more dry and then you again have a kind of deltaic region in the bengal so i think that there are different kind of features there are different kind of challenge uh, national mission for clean ganga is the implementing agency and uh, namami ganga is integrated river conservation mission so in 2014-15 government announced this new program i had a kind of unique uh, experience that i was in that mission in environment ministry as joint secretary so pre Namami Gange also I had about one year experience about how we were struggling and what we were doing and uh, then then I continued and then I again came back in 2018 as director general of Namami Gange mission. So primarily we are looking at four uh, verticals pollution abatement of course uh, is an important thing and initial focus was more on the pollution abatement of all kinds. Then improving ecology and flow becomes another thing then strengthening people river connect because unless community connect is strengthened perhaps you will not get so much of result and then we also gave a lot of focus upon research that's why a conference like this india australia partnership on water i think there are there are several such collaborative arrangements we, we did from our mission also and especially from the Indian institutes, uh, IITs, different IITs. So I think research and knowledge co-creation remained very, very important for us in this mission and it continues to be so. Now, what we call Ganga River Basin Management Plan, it was started quite some time back and we got it in 2014-15. It was very nice because this plan, again, it's not like European Union uh, water framework uh, uh, river basin planning documents where very specific targets are given for five years and they work. This is more like a strategic plan. But what it does, it also brings basin characteristics for the first time in a very clear way that what all are the challenges, what all are there in the basin. So this plan helped us in uh, looking at Namami Gange, when we were designing Namami Gange program, perhaps this uh, this document from consortium of IITs uh, gave us a larger picture. And that's why no, otherwise it would have remained a kind of again STP or sewerage treatment uh, plant making mission, but it became a much bigger, uh, larger mission. Uh, then in 2016, actually we were given, so this is important because institutional arrangement is important for success of a program. So government realized that we need to have a, um, a real delegation of authority and give a much larger mandate. So NMCG got a, a mandate for regulating as well as developing. So regulation of industries, regulation of water quality, notification of environmental flow. So all those things uh, were uh, delegated to uh, NMCG. This also brought a structure, five tier structure. National Ganga Council is chaired by prime minister. So you have a kind of support from the top uh, political executive. And uh, this National Ganga Council had chief ministers of basin states as well as several union ministers. So I think that uh, becomes an important uh, part and it goes up to the district level which is the actually functional level in uh, the, the area administration in the country it was also emphasized that we have been talking about ganga cleaning for decades but how to do it fast so i think all these institutional arrangements helped us in speeding it up and then 
in 2014, we have got Severus project only 28, that to a small ones, all put together only 500 MLD. Now we have got 160, almost 5,000 MLD capacity. So all so 10 times increase in capacity took place in this six, seven uh, years. And in terms of expenditure also, huge expenditure has been done. I think much more than what was done in 25 to 30 years before 2014, uh, almost three times of that has been spent, has been has been utilized, invested in seven years. So I think that that also started changing uh, the atmosphere and impact on the field. Then we also wanted to have this institution, uh, uh, this GRBMP one-time exercise will not help. So we created an institutional mechanism to bring academics with government on a continuous basis. So C Ganga is that mechanism. C, C Ganga is Center for Ganga Basin Management and Studies. So I think this was set up. And uh, uh, then another aspect was how we try to analyze that we have been constructing STPs and con condition of uh, river, river health has not improved much. So a survey was taken up and then we realized that we have been constructing, but performance has not been guaranteed. So I think you construct the uh, infrastructure, but it is not being operated and maintained well. And then you, you end up with a lot of, um, again, redoing things. So we introduced for the first time in India, the uh, PPP, hybrid energy model in, uh, in civil treatment plant. So, and if you can see on the right side, when in 2014, we had got uh, 1649, which you see that that's the kind of sewerage generation, nothing was planned for this part. So that red, red line you see, then 424 and then 880, 880 was there existing, but they were not working, not in a working condition. So we realized that we have to improve all of them. So we brought long-term operation and maintenance as part of our project. So it was 15 year annuity, Initially, it was on EPC. Later on, we brought hybrid annuity and 15-year annuity is there. So 40% we paid during uh, construction as per milestone and 60% of capex. The operator will get if he operates it well. So I think it is from construction paradigm shift to the performance has happened. Then we also went one step ahead and then we realized that a lot of old assets can be revived, rehabilitated. So we brought a concept of one city, one operator uh, concept, and then we tried to give in one big city, the old STPs, if you have to repair, you repair or rehabilitate them, construct the new STP as per the gap, and then maintain and operate and maintain them for 15 years, the same agency. So I think that has started uh, um, uh, finding good uh, response. And we also went for water reuse. Several projects were uh, done to reuse water with industry. So I think uh, that that kind of uh, a, a national framework for reuse of uh, treated wastewater also has been developed. Similarly, for industries also, there will be there was uh, primarily three kinds of strategy for industrial fluent. One is enforcement needs to be very strong. So we did a kind of inventory and then uh, enforcement was strengthened and infrastructure support was given to industry like Kanpur, like textile industry, tannery industry. So I think they were given infrastructure support and then we brought in good technology, greener technology with the help of several uh, international collaboration also, some centers of excellence were also created. So, so as a result of all these things, today you see good improvement in the water quality. So DO level is uh, more than five throughout the length of the river. BOD also in a major part of the river, BOD has come below three. But yes, I think it's a work in progress and still a lot of uh, work has to be done. And if you see now, as far as main Ganga is concerned, we have got 2,374 MLD capacity um, uh, already created. And for 9, 989 also, the remaining also works are in progress. So I think there is nothing which is not planned. So that stage has come uh, in, in this. Uh, coming away from um, uh, pollution abatement, we look at environmental flow. I think uh, some minimum flow needs to be ensured. So there was a lot of debate. And again, uh, th there was a lot of exchange with international experts also on determination of environmental flow. 
I think this is also an area where perhaps a lot more uh, deliberation can be done because it's still an evolving field in India. But we declared this in 2018 that that notification was given. Conservation of wetland was given top priority in this mission. And uh, all along Ganga, normally the wetland conservation program has been isolated. One, one wetland, two wetland here and there, some important wetland or Ramsar sites. But here we tried to look at floodplain wetlands. So systematically all along the river, especially in UP and Bihar, we have taken up 10 kilometers from both sides of the river, trying to rejuvenate this wetland, notify them, have a kind of good survey done, protect them and then uh, notify them. Wetland along with floodplain protection, the idea is as it was very rightly mentioned by Professor Singh that groundwater situation is not really very happy situation in India. We have over exploitation of groundwater. So ultimately these are the things which will help us. So that has started about agriculture, sustainable agriculture. We, I need not tell much because I think all these things were very nicely, very effectively explained by uh, Professor Singh. But these are all part of our mission. See what happens, initial focus was more on the pollution abatement because you have to first soak cleaning, then people will also start believing and allow you to do some long-term exercise. So that was the strategy. But now this mission perhaps will have to do much more work along with agriculture department and states on agriculture side, because that is something very important. Here, I will also like to mention, the, the use of fertilizer and pesticides and the pollution, the non-point source pollution. I think the assessment of non-point source pollution is still at a very nascent stage in India. So I think this is also something where perhaps we can uh, get some idea. As I understand, agriculture and then the water in agriculture is very, I mean, there's a lot of development in Australia in Murray Darling Basin Management and all that. So I think this is an area perhaps we can, we can get some help and some advice from you about uh, non-point source pollution assessment and then what kind of strategies are there. Uh, biodiversity conservation is very biodiversity and forestation. We, we went by the scientific uh, forestation plan all along the river with the help of Forest Research Institute. So what happens, I think the natural uh, river escape, agricultural river escape, as, as well as also urban river escape, this forestry program was done. It's under implementation and now Environment Ministry has taken up similar approach for 13 more rivers in the country, in India, for developing a kind of scientific forestry program. Biodiversity converse, uh, conservation work is also going on and I think uh, this also includes, this also should include rather the soil biodiversity, having heard so much about that. And then as a kind of iconic species, the project dolphin also was launched last year. Uh, this is our national aquatic animal. And I think its health is also indicative of the river health. So I think that also becomes an important part of that. Uh, I will also like to just emphasize upon the cities because we realize that the cities uh, are a kind of, uh, um, uh, they create a lot of stress on the river health. So, and no matter how much we build up uh, STPs and those kind of pollution abatement infrastructure, unless we get into the mindset of the city administration, unless we get into the master plan, perhaps in the long run, because new cities will come, new, or new towns will keep on developing, so it will not uh, be enough. So we have started developing urban river management plans and river census master plans. So some guidelines have already come and a and lot of capacity building is needed for that, especially for the water sensitive urban design. So looking at the, the natural water cycle, how we can actually get in compatibility with uh, that natural water cycle becomes important. And going by our uh, uh, wetlands, because urban wetlands are under real threat of getting encroached. So, uh, so a kind of a special emphasis upon that also has been done. And again, to take it forward, River City Alliance was created recently, at last year we created, and now NIUA is uh, taking it forward. Idea is the cities which are on the bank of river or through which the river crosses, they should come together and then the city manager should also think of river because ultimately no one owns river and then river gets uh, all the solid waste dump and other things. So I, so this alliance is, uh, is an attempt, institutional attempt to go into that direction. 
and a few cities and we, we did not restrict it to only Ganga. We actually have opened it to other than Ganga Basin cities also. So they have also joined it. So I think towards end, I would like to basically say this is a very long and continuous process. And I think there are several aspects to it. I mean, this is a kind of uh, real wicked problem, difficult problem with several stakeholders, several levels of government, multi-sectoral approach. So primarily, I think while going through this uh, mission, uh, one thought that you have to basically keep on learning. So reimagining is that you have to learn from past, like we learned from past and went into long-term ONM. Now we have to also learn from best practices. So we also looked at some of the good international river rejuvenation uh, projects. Uh, the problem may be very difficult, but you have to come up with uh, flexibility. You have to come up with the agile solutions. Long-term vision has to be there, but people will not allow you to only talk of long-term. So you must show some result. Like we have started with river bank improvement, easy to work out those projects. So more than 200 river banks, which are very important for uh, river like Ganga, because people really go there. So I think they have been developed or they have been either constructed or they have been uh, renovated. So I think uh, some, some short term goals also were fixed and then where results could be seen. Be, reimagining is also important because everyone has different theory of how to rejuvenate a river. So someone will say that uh, we should not spend so much of money on pollution abatement, we should improve the flow. So this quantity versus quality debate uh, has been a, a major challenge in the beginning of the program. So it's not either or, actually we'll have to do both. So, so that becomes an important challenge, but similar kind of, this is one example, similar stakeholders have different viewpoints and perhaps uh, everyone has a very clear view how to rejuvenate Ganga. So I think you have to also reconcile to different viewpoints and then bring them together. Then capacity issues are there, technologies are there. We took a view that we will go for technology neutral approach. So we will not promote any technology, but outcome will be there. So I think any technology is uh, uh, possible. There is a vetting process. And then our procurement guidelines also said that if a, any technology, if it has been constructed anywhere outside India also, in, anywhere in the globe, with, with the required documents, they can also participate in our tender. So that actually helped us in bringing a lot of new technology and then uh, people started working. Financial support, as I told you earlier, our budget used to be so small. So for 30 years, something like 4,000 crore, some 4,000 crore, crore means around 40 billion Indian rupees was spent in from 85 to 2014. Now it is something like 118, 120 billion Indian rupees. So almost three times in six, seven years. So I think that financial support is important. And then by bringing hybrid annuity, we are also able to take more projects because we don't, the cash outflow is not immediate. So I think that is also very important thing. And then lastly, in the reconnecting part, because this question always, someone used to ask that who ultimately is owner of Ganga? or any river for that matter. Is it government's responsibility only? We all use this river, we all go to its bank and then use for different purpose. So how you can make people take the ownership because you, you keep on cleaning from one side, but people keep on making it dirty, the task will never be complete. So, so that led us to launch a kind of massive program for reconnecting. I told you about the construction of crematoria and then um, uh, river bank. Uh, so that is also an exercise to bring good amenities and good connection with people. But, but all kinds of activities we have done. We created a kind of community structure through different programs. We call them Ganga Prairie or Friends of Ganga, volunteers, uh, youth volunteers. So I think adventure sports were also used very effectively to do some rafting expedition all along Ganga. So I think a whole lot of uh, things were done to connect people with different stakeholders at different level, including the university students. So we have a huge university connect program also where people are actually looking at the students while studying also that think about river, that think about water management. So that was done. Similarly, this clap for Ganga.com, which you see, this, this is a platform to connect. I think uh, this is a very interesting way. There are lots of games, there are lots of reading material. There are also quizzes conducted on the I present also Ganga Quest, online quizzes 
um, going on. So all these things, and then the, the approach to collaboration helped us in, in moving ahead. And that's perhaps the only approach to, to really go, because if you start doing a, a stakeholder mapping, you end up doing several people. So again, same thing I'm trying to show that for doing all this thing, one thing is it has to be done continuously. Often people do not understand river rejuvenation. Uh, people will say, people kept on asking me when the Ganga will be clean. Now see, it's not question of when you, you can give a timeline for completion of the projects, but for any river to be clean, you have to keep it clean. So it's a kind of continuous process. New challenge will come, new pollution sources will also come. So you have to keep on improvising and you have to keep on learning and you have to keep on working. So I think that is the one thing uh, which is very important. And then something which I learned that you have to have a kind of self-belief where this is such a program where people have been trying and generally people feel that nothing much will happen, but we have seen some success. I agree, this is not permanent. It still be, I have to do a lot of work, but one has to be positive. One has to build up a team because without collaborative partnership, it is almost impossible to handle such a kind of program. I got lot of, we got lot of support from several institutions, national, international institutions to, to give some idea. So, uh, so this is something which is very important. And then I will uh, end up with uh, this uh, quote only that uh, you have to basically look at uh, what the river teaches you is if you do not pollute, defile, obstruct, it will remain pure it will then bring all the goodness of nature and help you live a happy, healthy and prosperous life. And this cannot be too much to ask for because in the kind of condition we have, especially in Indian condition, uh, we have got a kind of water stress. We have a huge population and that will keep on increasing, but we have limited sources of water. We will also have climate change impact and then the climate change impact will be seen very clearly through water. So sometimes it will be too much of water, sometimes it will be too little of water. So, so I think it's very important for us to, to give priority to maintaining water sources, whether it is river or wetlands, and then manage them well. And along with that, because without water, you cannot have food security. So water security and food security are absolutely linked and water management, management of soil health, I think these are all uh, absolutely linked uh, uh, schemes and each of these aspects actually has a scope of very intensive research and developing, uh, uh, creating uh, knowledge base. So once again, thank you for uh, giving me, inviting me for this, uh, 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 for participating in this uh, dialogue and I look forward to having uh, more collaboration on different aspects which i have also highlighted thank you thank, thank you very much uh, sri rajiv ranjan mishra ji i think uh, what you presented uh, really came from your heart you, you worked on the thing and uh, you can't get anything better so thank you and uh, i think uh, the last slide you so short uh, i think we really need to respect water and river and uh, that will really change things. And uh, you rightly said it's a wicked problem and uh, how it's hard to define and there's no perfect solution. So it's more about situation improvement, how we can make it better and better working yeah. and the role of community. I think these are very important. So uh, we open the forum now for questions. So we have about five minutes. So please uh, uh, either put in the, um, raise your hand or write in the chat box. So I think Dharma, Dr. Dharma Hagari. Uh, thank you, Rajant. Uh, Dr. Raja Mishra, I think it was a great uh, presentation. Uh, nice to hear about Ganga. I think we had uh, so much about it. Um, uh, I think the, you know, the presentation you made about cleaning Ganga, I think is really uh, very, very uh, interesting and uh, you know, good to hear that it's progressing very well. Um, my um, comment here is, um, 
Yes. In order to manage wastewater, the collection system is an, an important part of it. Um, my um, the understanding with the Indian collection system, I think um, mm -hmm. the designs were done some time back, and there was you know uh, still uh, you know the collection system is not very well designed, and uh, yeah, at least the capacity is not uh, properly planned, I suppose. Um, I think that creates a lot of problem. You know, one is, uh, you know, your wet weather flows, uh, you know, the goes behind uh, your uh, capacity of the treatment system, uh, which creates uh, lots of problems. Um, now, how that, uh, you know, the collection system problem is being addressed uh, in India. So your thoughts on that will be very useful. Thank you. Thank you. I think uh, you have hit the real uh, issue. While we were deciding upon the, the towns along Ganga and then the, a, a, assessing the kind of system for wastewater management. And it, 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 you won't be, I mean, it was really surprising for some places, STPs were constructed without any collection system. So, so I, I think we, I, I, I have several horror stories to share with you. So when we started, so we had to do city by city, a kind of rationalization. Now, as you say, the design of collection system is important, the trunk sewer and other, other sewer lines. But what we also did, because we are looking from the river uh, centric approach, river point of view. So some of the places we basically did the interception and diversion kind of strategy. So we intercepted the drain getting into the river, diverted it to one of the STP. If STP is not there, we constructed STP. So I think that was one approach basically to see that Ganga starts uh, getting better water or not um, uh, untreated sewage. But in the, in the same way, along with the other mission, urban mission like Amrut mission is there, where they are actually getting into the sewer line, we also got into that. From our project also, we have done a lot of sewer line, uh, uh, especially in the World Bank project. So I think we try to improve capacity. Uh, in fact, the DPRs also have a lot of problem in, I, I think the whole problem starts with the DPR, with not uh, proper designing of the entire system. So we have tried to improve that, but that plus, an approach to do end of pipe solution in the short run so that the river starts uh, getting free from untreated seaways and a lot of rationalization is needed in a city. Like in Kanpur, I can tell you very quickly, uh, 140 million liters per day, one huge drain was bringing like a waterfall, seaways fall used to be there. And we had an STP with 210 MLD capacity working at the capacity of 60 MLD. So I think capacity was there, even if it was not, it was not constructed in Amami Ganga, it was constructed in some other program earlier. But what we did, we diverted part of the this uh, drain to that particular STP. Part was diverted to another STP. So I think it, it's, a, it's a big task to go city by city and rationalize the whole thing. And then we have given all of it under hybrid energy to, for 15 years to a concessionaire. So that process also helps us in building and looking at the old uh, designs and improving it because the private party is investing 60% uh, upfront from his side. So he will be careful for getting into the design data and maps, which often you will not be even um, having it. So I think a lot of that kind of governance improvement also went uh, uh, in its own way through this process. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we have a question from Dr. Tanu Jindal, and then we'll have a last question from Professor Prabhat Kumar Singh Ji. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. The, this has been a very wonderful session. And uh, I have been working since long time on the solid waste management. Uh, it's a, it's a, not a question. It's, I would like to say that, you know, we have prepared a pilot project uh, on, the, on the basis of, you know, why not take care of your, your own waste? So my strategy has been when electricity goes, people have inverters and generators in their houses in India. No? Uh, electricity goes for a longer time. So they have all arrangements made. So why not take care of their own waste? So on that basis, we have prepared a model in PPP mode of a contribution of every resident, maybe 100 rupees a month or maybe, you know, 500, uh, 200 rupees a month and establish an STP plant over main sewer. 
with the help of rwa csr and also some aid from the government and we have also proposed uh, like you know um, since uh, these these uh, stp plants are over the main sewers just before where it meets the drain so the drain can be made as a reactor and uh, further flow of the waste to the river is avoided also uh, drains in india are all unlined so the leaching of the contaminants uh, uh, sewage waste from the drain is also avoided so you are saving it two ways you know you are saving ground water contamination you are saving rivers and also you are uh, you know making citizens responsible for taking care of their own waste so it is a kind of decentralization so this is what i would propose and uh, i would be happy to work uh, on the similar project i was in adelaide uh, last to last year and i've seen there it is been centralized but i am in go in touch with university of southern australia for decentralized small town for 300 houses uh, stp plant and also we are trying to build the stp plant which are which is which run on its own methane gas on own biogas you know on its own energy so in case electricity goes it keeps working so this is what i wanted to say thank you thank you tanu ji i think all uh, points you made are all very relevant and then uh, uh, the, the 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 whole irony is we manage everything we will be very careful about our drinking water electricity supply but we will not give same priority about disposing our waste so i think Absolutely. that is, that is the root uh, cause of all these problem which we discuss and then we have spent millions and billions of uh, dollars to correct these things so i think what you are saying is absolutely correct right from beginning segregation all these thing and several good projects have come up and you mentioned about decentralized thing what i feel i think at different places we have to have a kind of combination of centralized decentralized kind of thing and not everywhere sewage is required certain places septage management can also be of great help so so th there are there are lots of possibilities uh, and this field is uh, perhaps open now we have got a septage management policy also from urban development ministry here so i think lots of projects are going on that solution for a small town solution for big densely populated cities i think some township coming up should have their own in situ treatment plants then for for the treatment of drains something should be there we should actually think like we have said that i closed a particular intercepted a drain but now you intercept the drain at the end of the um, the drain where it is meeting the river but if the drain passes through the city carrying all the dirt then that's also a kind of problem so i think we'll have to do something for that as well so i think uh, there are several suggestions and several possibilities which exist as and what i am saying is on the basis of a mega project which i did with ministry of earth sciences on the unlined drains in delhi there are 16 unlined drains in delhi and all of them have become a leaching point to uh, contaminate ground water and once the ground water is contaminated how it can be treated we can treat a reverse river can treat it her, uh, itself in the next flow when when we stop putting in the sewage waste but mm -hmm. ground water once contaminated cannot be treated so easily i am not sure how it can be done so my proposal is you know we can do it on the pilot project you know basis in certain uh, colony and let's make rwa citizens involvement you know in it and once the involvement is there then automatically you start getting results and you know compost you can distribute to the citizens for their gardens and also the water treated can be given to the parks so it's a kind of you know dual benefit so i propose such kind of thing and uh, i have worked on it i am in touch with department of environment protection also and uh, uh, since my campus is in uh, outskirts of uh, delhi like you know it's in delhi ncr it's a very strategic location even noida we can think of so uh, this is a very unique approach and uh, i think participatory approach is the best thing uh, th thank you tanuji i think we have the um, breakout room so you can further discuss i think it's a good idea really important one and uh, i think in view of time probably we'll uh, will part the question of uh, professor prabhat kumar singh ji and some others for the panel discussion we will have so now hand over to karen back to you karen thanks very much so uh, as uh, professor meshwari said we're going to move into our breakout rooms and we'll be discussing the two questions on your program so 
the, we're asking you to look at the key challenges and opportunities for uh, soil and river, river health over the next five to 10 years in relation to research, training and capacity building. And the second question is about how we can grow and sustain collaboration between Australia and India in soil and river health, and whether this is with researchers or government or private sector or NGOs and so on. So those questions are now in your chat. You're automatically, uh, you've been allocated to a breakout room, so you just need to accept the invitation when it pops up on your screen. So please do accept the invitation and click on the link because we really want to hear your views and they're going to come through in the breakout rooms. What you need to do is um, click uh, join and uh, you'll be moved into the relevant breakout room. And we'll see you back here around um, in around 20, 25 minutes. And moderators, could I ask you please to press the record button in your sessions? Okay, so with regard to um, the first question, what are the challenges and opportunities um, related to soil health in research, training and capacity building for Australia and India <coughs> five to 10 years? In India, the challenge the challenges are you know to since the population is very very high, so the sewage waste and the um, solid waste which has been generated, the quantity is very high according to the landscape area, the metro cities and the cities are thickly populated, so in a way the river which carries them are overloaded with the sewage waste, and the sewage waste which is released is uh, you know is untreated. So untreated sewage waste is released in the rivers, which is, you know, making the rivers contaminated and their rivers are getting converted into drains itself. So what are so, the challenges with regard to the research? Is there any research happening on that? There is no research happening on that. In fact, uh, the current strategy is to uh, treat the sewage waste at the central system in some or the in very scanty some few places. While no effort has been made to decentralize the system of sewage treatment and uh, you know treat the sewage waste and then further re releasing you know it it in the rivers after treatment. Nowhere in the world the drains which carrying the waste are unlined. Okay, so that's one of the what's that one is, of the real challenges researching online challenge. groundwater. We need to line our drains if we really need to carry our sewage waste. Okay. Them, so that the groundwater is not contaminated. Okay. So this is the second challenge. Third challenge is the 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 load the drains are overloaded, drains are open. And these open drains are become a breeding point for mosquitoes and many kinds of pathogens. And fourth challenge is these drains are also posing threat to the environment. Yes. You know, air pollution and uh, the whole environment, it is very difficult for people to, you know, live near those drains. Okay. And the fifth challenge is that uh, the amount is so huge that the river cannot take that load. That is the yes. fifth challenge. Sil siltation problem. Yeah. And sixth challenge is that, you know, uh, that uh, there is no particular decentralization kind of technology so that the waste can be tapped, you know, at the main sewer. Okay. So that is the sixth challenge. Mm -hmm. Seventh challenge is that there is can no... I, can, I, can, I, can I just stop you there? I just need to give some airspace to some of the others in the group. Yeah, but I would just, just like to finish with this, that, you know, with the seventh thing, that the, the decentralization is required with the PPP model, okay. so which is not existing. Okay. Great. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, thank you. And if you at any time want to write those down and forward to us, that will go part of the, um, the workshop notes as well. Thank you. For somebody else with regard to challenges and opportunities with regard to research, training and capacity building with soil and river health, I, I just want to um, just have a quick uh, intervention. Isn't Ganga Namami have a program for the treating the sewage before it get disposed into the river? Is that not correct? Uh, Professor Bridges, I think I think they have a program of a city which one is nearby to uh, Ganga River. Yeah. Hmm. Uh, I think uh, they have not separately means uh, there is a plan simply they plan 
city where this means nearby the ganga and uh, i think uh, they treated all all this uh, waste material so i think uh, separately they have not any such type of uh, policy program mm -hmm. i guess one of the things i think i probably can just add into the discussions having around it is about circular economy um the if the capacity is built around using those wastes and recycle them back into the land. Um, I guess there is two challenges. One is the technological challenges. How are we going to uh, upper up scaling to the level uh, of the Delhi and um, um, Mumbai isn't that easy, but saying that it's being done. This, this technology is there. This is, we now it is being done here. It is being done in uh, London. It is being done in uh, other uh, uh, metropolitan politan cities. So the technology is there. It's about building capacity and I guess it's sourcing those um, uh, facilities to operate. And I guess the concept, I guess, needs, needs to conceptualization is that it's a benefits for all of, all part of the society. You get a waste management, you get a healthy river, you get a um, uh, recycle those rest back into the agriculture. So you, contributing towards uh, uh, productivity. So there's a technological side of that, that is capacity building side of it, and then there's a societal side of that. There's the public um, public acceptance of, um, so for example, using the treated water, for example, uh, uh, using the, the human waste going back to the systems after the treatments. So there's, there's a public perception societal aspect that need to be addressed. So I will say that is looking at the circular economy lens and with the system-based approach that probably can provide some framework to move forward on. So that's a good opportunity. Yeah, exactly. To the framework to move forward. Uh, there be another challenge uh, we faced in India, mainly there is a river mining problem. And due to this mining problem means a river uh, change every year, uh, track and uh, this change of track of river there is a problem of erosion so this one is also one of the major challenge in the country so uh, means uh, there there is a not a clear cut policy uh, means uh, about uh, mining of a river means there is some unauthorized uh, means uh, contractor they uh, do the mining of uh, rivers and from uh, there is a problem happen due to this one okay this is not uncommon in Australia either, I have to be honest. Mining is one of the largest users of the water. And, and if you can put in the context of Australia, uh, I always say in Australia, there's no, no more precious things in Australia is than water. And then if you look at the amount of water that's being used by the mining, mining activities, and then amount of water that is polluted by the mining activities, it's just enormous. There, uh, saying that there is a framework there is a policy framework it is about implementing those policy framework in a, in a way that um, ensure that the water is used use properly and uh, will make the things sustainable so technology and i guess we can highlight this is an area of be honest with you um cooperation between australia and uh, in india because definitely there is just a scope there there's a lot of technology in, in both uh, in terms of the mining sustainable mining but also the water use of mining and i guess you re it almost refers to the um the opportunity becomes the, the higher priority that there are projects mm -hmm. and easier to share the knowledge so that's a that's a good opportunity thank you anybody else like to talk about the, the challenges and opportunities with regard to research training and capacity building uh yeah so i would like to talk about the challenges from solid waste disposal sites, because especially when it comes to, recently we've been facing floods in Australia. <laughs> and so all the contamination that comes from the waste disposal sites as a result of the, of the what? Of the floods, eh? And, and not, uh, generally all natural disaster that comes that is unplanned, and gets in contact with the waste disposal sites, which, which just moves pollutants into the environment. Also, that is a challenge. And 
yeah, I prevent, I think it presents a good opportunity for research, like, yeah, how we can deal with such pollution. Yeah, by sharing the stories, we see we've got something in common. So it's helpful for both parties. Very good. Thank you. Any further opportunities for... No, no, I would like to uh, emphasize on institution building and the capacity in the context of managing all these issues. One thing is uh, in the, when you come to uh, the city level, it's all the heterogeneous groups. And uh, when you find these kind of issues, the people should get, uh, they should have this ownership and accountability towards better management of we're just having, difficult, we're having difficulty hearing there's the background noise there so we'll can you hear me now yes yeah. it's a little bit better okay. yeah so one is in cities especially so there are a lot of challenges one is people should participate and involve get involved in resolving these issues, yeah. For this, there must be proper institutional base. This institution is possible only through this, uh, you know, structuring. It is not uh, like in the villages, if you go, you can have some homogeneous groups. But in coming to the city, this is a heterogeneous group. And uh, keeping the people together and uh, making these issues resolved, is the biggest challenge actually. Yes. So for them, there must be a proper institutions to groom these uh, institutions and to take the people more responsibility to find a proper solution towards this. And once these institutions forms, they should be handheld with the capacity building programs properly. And the, those institutions should sustain longer with those responsibilities. Then only they can be able to find uh, some kind of uh, solutions, the rising problems. That's my opinion. Okay, that's good. And it's all about getting people together, owning the problem and helping develop solutions together. Good. And if you think we've missed anything, just make a few notes in the chat box so we, we do capture that because I think you've made some really valid points there. Thank you. Okay, we have eight minutes left. Unless anyone wants to add something to the um, challenges and opportunities, can we look at that second question? How do we initiate and sustain the civic collaboration over the next five to 10 years with regard to training, capacity building and research? Somebody else who we haven't heard from yet. Question two. Yeah, I think uh, this is very important uh, point here, how uh, we do uh, significant collaborations between Australia and India for capacity building means uh, this uh, we can do by uh, means a collaborative project and uh, exchange program of student and uh, means uh, involve some industry or NGOs and through that one we can uh, means uh, make a more vibrant collaborations between these two countries. Yes, thank you. And what, what would make it more attractive for those organizations to get involved, to get that collaboration going? Anybody? Oh, that's a good point. Workshops, masterclass, training of trainers, yes. And I think another good point too is that if we do what I like about workshops and masterclasses, that we document the process for running those masterclasses so we don't need to start from scratch each time. So if we have a good process, that we share the process for those masterclasses. Thanks, Baj. Somebody else? Initiate and sustain this collaboration. Academic and student exchange. 
Yes. Good, thank you. Professor Jindal. Does anybody have a, what about a question or an area that hasn't been explored with regard to um, the challenges for soil and river health? We've had a good lot of input. Is there any questions or points that you'd like to, to make a note of? What about examples or resources or uh, research that you're familiar of with? You know, we've, we've had some really two great case studies today. What about other research or collaboration that you're familiar with that could be useful? Uh, Debbie, please, please repeat your question. I just wonder, does anybody have any um, ideas of other case studies or research that's been going on or, or projects in other towns or countries that may be relevant to soil and river health, that training capacity building research? Are you uh, working on any other work? Uh, actually, uh, presently I am working in Kashmir and uh, we are handling one project for uh, water security for rejuvenation of uh, spring. And uh, what we did in uh, that area, actually we are working uh, uh, in Kupwara district of uh, Jammu and Kashmir and it's a border area of uh, nearby Pakistan border area. And uh, we are working there. And uh, what to, uh, actually, this uh, two year back, this project was started. And uh, uh, first, we uh, make uh, all uh, means uh, different uh, spring inventory, and uh, we uh, measure all physical and chemical parameter of spring water. And uh, we have selected four five springs, and uh, then further uh, we did. Uh, uh, work on that one uh, we have taken different uh, means uh, conservation measures and through that conservation measures uh, we uh, means uh, uh, increase uh, means uh, more water in the soil means infiltration rate increase and through means uh, this intervention means uh, taking different engineering measures and uh, what we found now uh, means uh, there Nearby, there is one means uh, not a uh, big river, but very minor river and uh, uh, flow rate that is increased that one means uh, using different engineer engineering uh, means measures uh, through okay. different interventions. Thank you. So that work we are doing in Kashmir in Kapwara district. So Kashmir district, was it again? Uh, Kash Kashmir, uh, the Jammu and Kashmir, the one state now it is means UT Union Territory. Can, can you just write that down too? So we've got a link to that so we can make sure that's included that district within Kashmir, please. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. We can do that. Anybody else? We've got three minutes to go. So if you'd like to share a point, ask a question. Challenges, opportunities. Research, how do you build the capacity of people? Yeah, in India, actually, under the National Hydrology Project, so under the Ministry of uh, Water Resource, we call Jal Shakti. So we have been doing extensive training programs, but under uh, almost all the resource uh, institutions, we call the Water Resource Department in each state. So we have 48 agencies we are working with. So each every state is called an agency. Now we have been the, uh, we continuously, this is an 80 year, eight years program. And we have been doing this consistent uh, training programs to all these uh, government institutions. So there are multiple trainings relating to the major objective is to build water resource management institution so that they can make better management of this water. And it, it, it includes not only the flood water, but also the flowing water through rivers and also uh, how to manage these water resources. And also we have collaborated 
with various institutions at ground level also, including the education institutions and colleges, the, all these things. But still, uh, even Young Water Professions Program is now is going on. This is one of the important things in collaboration with the Australian government. Yes. So like this, there are a lot of so, programs are, so we are doing. But still, there are a lot of things to learn from Australia. So all these things are, so we are expecting a lot. Yes, yes, thank you. We need to learn from what's working well and to, um, to apply those programs elsewhere. Yes, let's not keep reinventing the wheel. Thank you. Okay, we've got 45 seconds left. Any further points, ideas, suggestions? I think also considering like more ways to increase dissemination of research, like so that research done does not stay with the institution, but it goes to the wider community. Yes, make it more available and easily accessible. Yes. Right. All right, well, I'm going to wind up now with our 15 seconds left to go. Shane, are you comfortable um, reporting back to the whole group? Just the key yeah. points we've come up with? Yeah, that's all right. We, this is all, this session's being recorded, so it will be transcribed as well. So thank you, everybody, for your input. Oh, they've given me 57 seconds. We're closing. Okay, any final points before you leave and join us in the whole group? No, that's okay. Thank you, everybody, for your time. I really appreciate your input. All right, see you back in the main room. So we've got two questions to walk on. Um, Just a suggestion, Damoja. Uh, could you have an introduction to everyone? Some people may not know. So just... Oh, yeah, yeah, should notice. Yeah. But that uh, will probably do that later when... Uh, if you got some time, but anyway, it's a, it's a good way to start. Uh, so my name is uh, Dama Hagre. I'm from Western Sydney University. Um, uh, I work uh, in the wastewater recycling um, and uh, urban water management. Um, yeah, so uh, Anu, would you like to go next? Thanks, Dharma. So Anu Kumar, I'm based in Adelaide and uh, I work for CSIRO. Here in Adelaide, so I work on water quality issues in uh, risk assessment of chemicals to human health and ecosystem health. I'll stop it there. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, Dr. Prabhat Singh, you're muted. Yes, namaste. I'm Professor Prabhat Kumar Singh. I'm from IIT BHU Varanasi. I basically uh, learn in river health rejuvenation area. Uh, that is the area in which I have been acting and working together. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much. Uh, Dr. Nasim Reddy. Yeah. Um, uh, Namaskar Ji. Um, I'm Nasim Reddy, work in the School of Science, Western Sydney University. Uh, my main research area is, uh, I mean, part of the research area, I would say, is um, functional foods. Uh, it's it's not much to do with uh, water, but uh, anyway, any anything to do with food is require. I mean, basically require water. Uh, so it's functional foods and biological activities of uh, food products, and mainly bioactive chemical constituents. We water work on. very closely linked. <laughs> yeah, very closely linked. Yes, it's it's uh, basically. A good quality crop production is uh, <laughs> is the key for all these important bioactive molecules. Yeah. Thank you. Um, thanks. Uh, thank you. Thanks very much, uh, Archit. Thank you, the <clears throat> thank you, Dharma. Um, hi, my name is Archit. Uh, I'm interning with the Australian Institute today. I'm in this room uh, to record and make sure everything's technically right, but also to listen into all the amazing conversation that's going on. I study uh, sustainability at the University of Melbourne. Um, and I'm originally from uh, the Sitapur district of Lucknow, uh, near Lucknow, so in Uttar Pradesh. And uh, it's, it's really interesting to hear all of these conversations um, from Melbourne and, and know what's going on in India as well, yeah. Mm. Um, thanks so much, sorry. Uh, thanks, 
Yeah, Yiti Gupta. Uh, can you put on your uh, video, please? Uh, no, probably gone somewhere, I think. Okay, Basant and uh, Rajiv, I think uh, you both are uh, yeah, you know, pretty much to know everyone. So <laughs> you want to just say a couple of words, I suppose. Yeah, Basant Maheshwari, Professor in Water Environment and Sustainability at Western Sydney University. Uh, Rajiv, Rajiv Ranjan Misra, I was uh, till recently Director General of National Mission for Clean Ganga. Uh, presently, I am associated with National Institute of Urban Affairs as their Chief Technical Advisor. Is that a private organization or a government organization? No, this is government. Uh, the, uh, the Ministry of Housing and Urban Affairs is a think tank within that ministry. Oh, okay. okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, so these are the two questions. Um, Sorry, you missed the ET. Uh, oh, ET is back now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. she's Hello, back. Uh, good morning, uh, everyone. Okay. Myself, Kitty Gupta, and I'm working as an assistant director in National Water Informatics Centers. Um, basically, our organization dealt with the India Water System, which is a water resources information system. And we are also handling uh, WIMS, Water Information Management System. Uh, the agencies who are dealing with the water resources data collections, they are uh, attached with us and they are uh, uh, sending us the data and we are maintaining uh, it on our platform. So that's about me. Thank you. Okay. Thanks very much. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much for joining today. Yeah. Um, so um, I'm sharing my screen here. Um, so it basically has got uh, two questions. Um, so the first question we are talking about, uh, what are the key challenges and opportunities related to soil and river health in research, training and capacity building for Australia and India uh, for the next uh, five to 10 years? So we need to sort of, uh, you know, identify what are the, you know, the challenges and the opportunities uh, in, the, in this particular area. So- Can I, can I suggest uh, maybe, yeah. I think there is a lot of more interest in river health. So maybe you focus on just river health. Just the river health, yeah. yeah. So we'll uh, probably leave this for the other groups, yeah? yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, no worries. Okay, so who wants to start? I can start. Um, yeah, sure. I would say uh, that, so um, yeah, could thanks. you move the, uh, Stop the screen. I think we can see each other better. There you go. Yeah, no, it's, yeah. that's great. Um, I think if we look at challenges um, and opportunities, I think what Mishraji mentioned about the continuity, I think that's the the biggest challenge because I have worked in India and developed really good networks, but then the project finishes and then it's very hard to maintain those kind of re relationships. We try to do it, like I have done it, but it's not, um, it's based on the interest and the passion of the people who really are like-minded. So they are not being uh, recognized by the policy makers or the regulators or the government. So I think that's the challenge. Um, I feel, uh, and there are very, uh, researchers and um, you know the people who really want to make a difference they are at both sides and we can see today also about their long-term work so I think it's not an issue about how we can tackle the problem it's more about having that continuity and having that long-term plan rather than even three to three years it took me three years just to know the people you know and develop that trust where you can be open and have that transparent communication. So I feel uh, it should be a 10 year plan rather than a three year project um, from my side. The second thing that I mentioned in the last workshop, I think we talk about this uh, uh, bottom top approach. I think that's very critical. So people or the young scientists or even the technical staff who are actually on ground there should be exchange visits of those people coming to Australia and they are young professionals going to India. I think that helps in understanding the problem. Uh, I've seen it from this end being involved in a 
project where my postdoc learned a lot. Similarly, having a postdoc here, uh, learning about, he's a great scientist, but he never uh, thought about health and safety issues. And suddenly say, oh, we need to wear glasses. We need to protect ourselves when we work with chemicals. And the recent example was with Basanji's um, in his project, having Pralad to come and spend eight weeks with us. And he has grown immensely with that training that he's running a lab in Rajasthan. So I think those are, the, there are successful examples, but we need to more spend more on those exchange visits uh, over a time because that helps in the transfer of the knowledge and the sharing of knowledge and trusting each other. Thanks. Okay, fantastic. That's a very good point, Anup. Um, especially, I think, with, uh, with the real health management, you really need a long-term plan, isn't it? Yeah. So, um, yeah, so, Mishraji, if you would you like to say something? Yes. Uh, thank you, Anupma ji. I think you really summarize the challenge, like continuity, because as I told you, na, people want quick results. So they want something to be done quickly, but I think it's a very, very long-term process and continuous yeah. process. Uh, you said about exchange visit, that's that's useful, but a uh, lot of successful uh, cases are also there, whether it is wastewater management or water management or rejuvenating a small um, rivers or wetlands. So maybe we can also look at uh, creating a mechanism for documenting these things. So create a kind of good knowledge base and then share it. We can develop some training modules, etc. Also, maybe some online yeah. courses, uh, online courses, etc. Yeah. At present in National Institute of Urban Affairs, actually we are trying to work on, um, I, it started with NMCG, but I gave this project and now I am there, the River City Alliance. The idea is to bring these cities, the city managers, because they feel that they are not responsible for the river. So a lot of dumping of city garbage takes place on the floodplain. So maybe some sort of water positive city or uh, water sensitive urban design. I think uh, uh, Australia has a lot of very good example of those kind of documentation. Uh, we can bring bring some of them to India also and then apart from IITs, NIUA can also because NIUA is a government of India think tank on urbanization. I mean the entire urban gamut is there. So through that perhaps we will be able to reach out to not only Ganga Basin but any other state also. So I think that could be a good way to um, put it there. Uh, I have also recently, I am also attached with the Department of Management Studies in IIT Roorkee. IIT Roorkee is also an important, uh, I think, very active participant in this uh, partnership. So maybe I think we can use some of them also. A lot of managerial concepts could also be developed through these case studies, and then we can take it uh, take it forward. So we, in NIUA, we have started developing an online course program, online training program on managing urban rivers. So this, this has several aspects, water, wastewater, riverfront management, riverfront design. So I think we can perhaps develop some of these things. We can create a kind of list of several things which we can do. Of course, one thing is basin level management and one thing could be looking at the urban thing. And then perhaps in the end, we can also have a connect between basin connected cities. So I think something like that, we can, we can go for a kind of longer term vision in that. Okay, fantastic. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Reddy. Uh, yes, uh, thank you uh, for the opportunity, Dharma ji. Um, Professor Mishra ji, uh, you've uh, made an excellent presentation on uh, Ganga River uh, purification and things like that. I uh, did my PhD from IIT Kanpur um, okay. a long time ago. Uh, in chemistry, of course, <laughs> and uh, structural aspects of uh, biomolecules and so on and so forth. But as students, we used to visit Ganga River quite often from, from IIT Kanpur Gate, actually Bitur, Bitur is a place where Bitur. Bitur Ganga is. flows and then we used to go for picnics and all. Okay. Just I also picnic. used to go as a student of IIT Kanpur. <laughs> uh, that's right. So it was a nice place to uh, go, and but it was uh, really... Um, uh, bad to see that Ganga River has, uh, I mean, waters have got uh, uh, 
uh, to the stage where the purification, uh, real purification was required. But in any case, like uh, my question is, uh, uh, our question or comment as a non-expert uh, water person, this uh, Tanuji has also uh, uh, asked or commented on a very good aspect, the solid waste from uh, cities should be treated and collected as soon as possible rather than letting it flow for long distance until the rivers. Uh, uh, so that, that's one uh, good thing in not only in terms of river health, but also groundwater health. Um, and also like that treated uh, solid waste collected and uh, treated solid waste converted into compost will also improve the soil health. I mean, can be used to improve the soil health. So probably it will have double benefit uh, if we have projects in that direction, I would think. Mm. So that will help to recycle the nutrients, I suppose. Re yeah. Recycle the nutrients mm. as well as uh, uh, groundwater health, uh, I mean, prevent damage of groundwater uh, 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 health as well, and then ultimately prevents uh, to a large extent river uh, pollution. Mm. Mm. Yeah, fantastic. Uh, so, who wants to go next? To Archit, you want to make any comment? Um, I uh, don't have any particular comments, but uh, I, I have a question uh, mm. in terms of from what I've been listening, I guess. Um, so uh, the, the the smaller sort of like, you know, I live in the heart of the Gangetic Plains and the smaller farmers and like, you know, uh, in, in towns and villages that are doing a lot of agriculture and uh, drawing in a lot of water and uh, still using sort of like, you know, uh, old ways to fertilize. They're not exactly using precision farming or, or artificial intelligence. Uh, what What is... Uh, what do we think is the timeline where we're able to reach these small towns and areas um, uh, given climate change is such a real possibility in the next 10 years and uh, would we be able to do it in time like uh, and what kind of resources would be required from your perspective um, I guess um, to, to get it done uh, before it's too late I guess. Mm, thank you. So probably, Mishraji, would you like to comment on that? Uh, I think we might run out of time. No, no, no. Yeah, uh, and yeah. Professor Prabhas Kumar Singh, I think he... Yeah, 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 go on, uh, Prabhas Singh. Uh, sir, uh, I have uh, just a few points to ask uh, from uh, Mishra, sir. Uh, this is, uh, at one point you told people's ownership and then municipal corporations responsibility when we are talking about this uh, river city alliance what part of responsibility the city administration takes where i mean we involve the people and what will be the parameter how people are connected so uh, i mean i just wanted to know uh, as an engineering professional who is concerned with river health or restoration something like that how we are doing that that's all thank you uh, I think uh, I will give a very quick answer. While working in this river health uh, related issue in NMCG, I realized that the stakeholders, the city level stakeholders are not so much concerned with the river. And that was the purpose why I started a program of urban river management and we are giving them infrastructure. I mean, that's also something which we can think of an opportunity. We give them infrastructure. Now I'm giving them for 15 years, hybrid annuity may be funded by Namami Gange Mission, but what happens after 15 years? So I think they have to start getting involved into this and then they have to take responsibility. So urban river management program we started and then also I created this river city alliance because once they come again and again, to different meetings and all that, they will get a little more sensitive about that. So, so that is the purpose. I mean, it's a huge challenge, but having seen this gap, we started this program. 
and now NIUA is taking it forward because now NIUA advantage is statistically they are part of the urban development ministry. Now that is the line ministry at government of India level. So the municipal commissioners will listen to them. They won't listen to NMCG. They will certainly listen to them. So that's the that's the way administration is done. So I think that is one way to get into that. And then one the quick point I will add to what Archit and others saying. I think one thing, something which we can perhaps think of a kind of opportunity about reuse. I mean, certain work on the reuse. There is a huge opportunity of reusing treated wastewater in adjoining areas. But what happens? The peri-urban area agriculture. I mean, unorganized way it is being used. But I think if we can plan a project. So something like that, if the universities and we can sit together and do it, when you plan an STP for a city, if we can look at some of the reuse possibility in the adjoining area and peri-urban area and develop a project, maybe some model project, one can do some research and develop that so that right from beginning, you are actually using it. We had some STPs where we are actually generating power to run the STP. In Varanasi itself, the Dinapur STP is generating power to run 140 MLD. So similarly, I think we should now in future design all the STP, all the wastewater management system, including solid waste management system also, keeping in mind that where it can be utilized. Once an economic thing gets attached, then people will also be interested in running of this plant. Suppose I give it to an industry a refinery like Mathura, we are giving to refinery. Refinery will ensure that our STP runs and runs with good quality. Otherwise, their refinery will get affected. So I think we'll have to develop some of these kind of networks also. Okay. I think we're I just want to make a comment. Yeah, go on. I think the question was uh, what two countries can collaborate. So I think Anuji has mentioned the exchange of uh, young water professionals or young river health professionals. Yes. And second one was the, Mr. Ji mentioned the reuse of water in urban, peri-urban region. And I would also like to suggest, uh, there's a good example of community involvement in Australia called land care. So I think there are some lessons how community group of people get together, look after their land and there have been this thing has been running for last 30 years, very, very successful. And there could be some, not everything can be adopted to Indian condition, but there could be a, uh, some, so we can do some workshop. What does that mean for river health? And the one point I want to make is the, how can we transfer the science of river health to ordinary people? Mm -hmm. but, uh, I think people will be more, helpful uh, if they know the science, then science should be in an understandable way. Yeah. And uh, citizen science, I think that's what I want to come to. Very important. Yeah, so okay. actually we, I don't know whether you know, but the, we developed uh, this Marvi thing, how community can be involved in groundwater monitoring management. Vasant, we have got only 20 seconds. Okay. Okay. So I'm done. <laughs> yeah, hello. I just want to add one thing that apart from all these projects, which usually research institutes and the organizations work, but the other important thing is the awareness. We have to bring that awareness to the local people to work with us and to support the facts, basically. So that's what I want to add into that. Yeah, very, very good point. Very good point. Uh, now you are Shri. You, you're there. Can you? Oh, no. Disappear. <laughs> okay, I think uh, we have got only 40 seconds left. Uh, any any additional comments uh, anyone wants to make? So uh, I think there's some uh, scoping study on reuse mm. in two countries and what is done in citizen science between the two countries. And uh, I think there are some good work done here and good work done in India, how yeah. both countries can learn together. Yeah, so develop some case studies. Case studies, yeah. Yes. And really bring them together as a science for everybody. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, my name's Roger Packham. I'm a Associate Professor at Western Sydney University. I'd like to now go round each person and ask you to introduce yourselves. Uh, so who'd like to go first? Just a few seconds, uh, that's all we need. Yeah, so Ranveer Singh, uh, I'm from uh, New Zealand, outsider in your group. <laughs> uh, 
but I did work uh, with Professor Basant uh, in Western Sydney University before I came to New Zealand. So I'm Wonderful. associate professor at the Massey University in environmental hydrology and soil science. Originally from uh, Northern India, close to Delhi, uh, grew up in a village in Sonipat in Haryana. Thank you. Who'd like to go next? Yes, sir. Namaskar, sir. And good morning, sir. Good morning. This is Dalvir Rana from Department of Irrigation and Water Resource. I am working as a hydrologist in the Irrigation Department Government of Haryana, that is a part a state very near to Delhi. Thank you. Uh, next, please. Don't be shy. Uh, I'm Mariana Saris. Uh, I work at the Australia India Institute, and I'm here to record the session. So I'm helping oh, the admin you. side. <laughs> okay. Thanks a lot. We've got two more. Yeah. Yeah, I'm Prala Soni. Uh, and uh, I am working in Marvi project, uh, which is running in Udaipur district, Rajasthan, uh, from last 10 years with Professor Basad Mahesuri and all the Sydney University team and some of the CSIRO scientists, uh, in which uh, uh, Dr. Anu Kumar and uh, Rai Kukana and uh, all with all, all the persons. Mm -hmm. yeah. Hello, yeah. Prahlad. Nice to see you again. Who's next? Does anyone else like to introduce themselves? Oh, hi, I just want to check, uh, Mariana, if this is being recorded. Uh, yes, it is. Yeah. Great, thank you. Yes, it is, Alex, thanks. Okay, um, we've got a couple more people. Uh, would you like to turn your uh, uh, videos on and introduce yourselves? You'll have to unmute to introduce yourselves. No. Okay, well, we'll um, skip that then um, and start the discussion. Uh, let's start with the, the first question, um, that, which is uh, uh, in the chat box there. Um, uh, who'd like to kick up uh, about uh, research and training and how we can do it better over the next 10 years in this area? Any comments? Oh, sorry. First of all, someone needs to record this uh, or, or make notes of this to uh, present back to the whole group. Would anyone volunteer to do that, please? I can do that. Thank you very much. Great. Um, OK, so who'd like to kick off with some discussion points? We've heard some very interesting talks. Um, does that uh, open up any ideas for people as to what research and training uh, needs to go on? Yeah, I think the in in terms of uh, the were health and given my experience uh, being born close to Delhi, looking at the Yamuna River, for example, and working in in different uh, places in Australia, New Zealand here. I think the big two challenges there are two, there is the withdrawal of water uh, that has impact on the river and uh, the discharge of wastewaters. And I think that the both needs to be addressed uh, quite equally so. Uh, so I think the research training capability in terms of, uh, you know, to manage the river system, we need to manage the, the area or catchments behind them. So I think uh, how do we use our uh, land around there, what the water demands are from that kind of agriculture, what withdrawals we are uh, making on the rivers, uh, and also trying to understand the seasonality of uh, flows into the river and how we can make use of a, a, a more like monsoon water uh, uh, to benefit both the river and the water demand. I think one of the area that would be quite interesting to look at, uh, at the moment we basically just get this uh, monsoon water and we try to drain it as fast as we can. 
because it creates the flood issues and it creates all sorts of issues. But that's quite a bit of resource for us uh, into those areas. And I'm speaking more from Northern India point of view. So how do we make more use of that monsoon water? Uh, what kind of a research uh, training infrastructure capability we need into that? That's one thing. I think the, the, the wastewater discharge, uh, looking on the reuse of wastewater, but also not only treating and reusing the wastewater, also thinking about how we can probably create some system within the households that the less wastewater is generated and the water demand is also less. Can we probably develop some gray water systems uh, that can divert the water from one use to another use within the household, let's say shower water going to the flush the toilets, uh -huh. Uh -huh. creates the, the less demand on water and less on the wastewater. So how do we go about that? That's, those are the, the, from my point of view, quite a, a topical things to, to look at. And then it comes to the soil health. Uh, and, <laughs> you know, I think uh, it's a, it's also a bit of question of from the farmer's son point of view, that how do you incentivize farmers to do the practices that are looking after the soil health? Uh, as a farmer, I would like to crop as much as possible. Probably not a good idea for the soil. Mm. So, <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, you've raised a lot of uh, very interesting issues there. Um, and uh, of course, what we need to keep in mind that the situation in India uh, behind the rivers, you've got a lot of small farmers, whereas in Australia, it's mainly larger farmers. So uh, th there's a lot of difference there. And the issues you're raising is how do we incentivize small farmers? Yeah. Um, certainly some of the stuff we've heard about application of fertilizer will be very uh, appropriate because that's uh, one of their major expenses. So, uh, but would yeah. other people, anybody else like to come in on this discussion? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, Thank I you. I would also like to, I would, uh, since I am working in a state from where Mr. Ranveer Singh was born and he was talking about. So I would also like to join the problem in the same area that we have an issue of soil salinity in this uh, whole area and in most of the central Haryana part. So we must have uh, increase our capacities and also research to reduce the soil salinity, which ultimately uh, related to the groundwater quality issues. And uh, we are nowadays due to increasing water levels, there is an issue of uh, uh, water logging and uh, soil salinity, salinity both. So we have to address both the issues simultaneously uh, in view of the fact, because uh, the most of the people in this area, majority, uh, are uh, basically related to farming. Yeah, yeah. And that relates, of course, to some of the issues we discussed uh, last week at the, at the first workshop. So, yeah, thank you. Uh, anybody else have a comment here? Prahlad, I guess this uh, links in, uh, the participant stuff links in with what you're doing in, uh, in Rajasthan. Would you like to comment at all? And now you have to unmute your microphone to uh, be heard. There's, uh, um, most people have their microphones muted at the moment. I suggest you unmute them so you can come and uh, join the discussion. Okay, I'm still seeing one, two, three, four of the six mics are muted. <laughs> okay, well, there's only three of us able to speak and join in this conversation of the six of us. Uh, I'm not quite sure why the other mics aren't being unmuted. Is this a, a technical problem we have? I don't know, okay. Well, there's only three of us able to talk here, so let's keep the conversation going. Um, uh, how do we envisage some of this research and training going on? Any, any comments on this? 
<clears throat> so I go first. Uh, please do. Yeah, I think that the, there is a obviously lot of a opportunity there <clears throat> is uh, building the research capability into uh, our Indian system. And that would be done through exchange, uh, exchange of the staff uh, into universities, also having the joint uh, research projects, for example. And uh, also quite a bit of, a, I think, the, the, the capacity build up into our management department for these resources by by giving more, uh, sharing more tools, more information, and helping to build the information systems. I think one of the thing there is that uh, in in the systems we don't have a lot of a, a detailed information systems and tools we need to do the management. Right. Yeah, so those will be my my yep. top of the mind thing, yeah. And of course, through the uh, Australia Institute um, uh, ARCH program, there will be some opportunities and funding for these sorts of things. So mm -hmm. um, the Australian government is providing some funding, I gather, um, mm -hmm. for that. Uh, anyone else? Uh, uh, you will need to unmute the microphones. I'm, I'm not seeing... Uh, any unmuted microphones at the moment so but would any of you like to come in by unmuting and speaking otherwise we've got a two-person conversation going on uh, the idea of the breakout room of course is to share ideas and and join in the discussion um, I'm um, I would encourage you to put your videos on and to unmute your microphones. Um, perhaps people are having technical difficulties doing that. There we go. You've managed to do it. Well done. Would you like to speak? A very good morning to everyone. Good morning. Yeah, good evening. Uh, so uh, I'm Dr. Smithy from Irma Water Center from Irma. So we are basically working on the dairy sector, uh, the water and the water use in the dairy sector. So here I am uh, willing to hear more from people working on water conservation in different other sectors. Uh -huh. so probably, probably I, I just feel that there's no point in taking our discussion ahead, but just listening to others. Uh -huh. So we are currently working on water and water in center projects uh, in dairy sector in Gujarat. So what are the challenges in that uh, Samriti in the dairy sector water use in Gujarat? Uh, so since you know that Anand is, a, is the milk capital of India and you have abundant uh, resources since Anand is strategically a very, it has fertile land and has, a, has been able to take all the benefits of uh, the cattle that is present over here, the soil, the fertile lands that are there and the innovative farmers who are there. But the challenge currently now is that uh, the water investment is more in production side because in water processing, in dairy processing, the water uses has been reduced in terms of uh, the AI or the IOT things that have been uh, inculcated in different dairy plants. So the, currently the challenge is to uh, make the farmers aware of the amount of water that can be used ideally by them while producing the milk, be it watering their dairy animals or cleaning their shed or uh, bathing their animals or uh, taking miscellaneous, making miscellaneous use of the water while they're able to produce milk and give it at their local cooperative level. Hmm. Yeah. Yes. yeah. Of course, uh, uh, Gujarat's one of the areas the Marby project has been working in, uh, trying to achieve just that, getting farmers to understand uh, how much water they've got and to manage it sustainably. Yes, sir. Yeah. 
Um, you've also got problems in Gujarat, as I understand, along the coastline with uh, um, uh, salt water, uh, sea salt yes, water uh, coming into your aqua, into your groundwater aquifers. Yes, sir, because uh, Gujarat is located to the sea through Khambat, to the Gulf of Khambat. So water salinity over those areas are there. But since uh, Anand is centrally located uh, in Gujarat, that is away from, little away from the desert area, from the dry, dry areas of Kutch and Saurashtra. Yeah. So in that, in that case, Anand is strategically better uh, in terms of its resources. But it, it is just that the optimization of the use of those resources by the farmers has not been a little well because currently carbon emission is a challenge from the dairy sector and uh, water usage uh, is important in that case. So currently we are working on the water uh, use that is there in the production side for milk production yeah. from, uh, in, from Gujarat because Gujarat is considered as a model state or the Anand model is actually a model for other states. Yeah. when it comes in terms of dairy sector in India. Mm -hmm. So the, yes, the water they use into the dairy sheds is the source from the groundwater or is it the canal water supplied? Sir, so the groundwater also, canal water supply as well, both. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. But interestingly, interestingly, uh, there's another plant that is Banas Dairy, which is in Banaskantha area, closer to Rajasthan. In the dry area, in the dry lands of Gujarat, they are able to surpass the production of milk as compared to ones in Anand, and they have been able to produce more milk despite uh, the water scarcity in that area, because Banaskanta is a dry land, and mm -hmm. they are uh, producing twice or thrice more amount of milk. Milk is procured also and also produced. So this is an interesting study that we are trying to make comparing different districts of Gujarat. Mm, yeah. So that, so that, yeah, so that that can be replicated in other states, be it in drier states, uh, somewhere in uh, West Bengal, be it in Odisha, or in uh, Rajasthan, all those areas. Mm, mm. Yeah, that's interesting, Samriti. I'm working with one uh, group in Punjab. Uh, okay, with one of the university there, Gadwasu, and we are looking uh -huh. on the water footprint of uh, dairy production systems into Punjab, and because here in New Zealand we we do those studies looking on our dairy dairy water use. That's an interesting topic. Yeah. Sounds like a good opportunity for networking. Then. Yeah. Yes. It is. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we should exchange our emails and follow on the discussion. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Great. Great. Yeah. I will, yeah. Uh, yeah, so, I mean, that's our second question is extending the networking, isn't it? So yeah. uh, um, it, it strikes me that a, a lot of um, the opportunity we have in these workshops is to connect people, to find out who's interested in what, who's doing what and so on. So, yeah. yeah. Um, one yeah. of the things that struck me on the first talk was on Saw Health was one of the questions raised about what can Indian farmers do because they are much smaller farmers. And it would seem to me that that's a research area that uh, probably isn't going on outside India because, you know, in the West, uh, in Europe and in, in Australia and America, you're looking at large farms rather than small farms. Is there anything going on in India like that? Does anyone know? Yes, sir. Oh. Yes, sir. I would. I would like to share some studies which we are working here. Wonderful. In yeah, just like we have a soil central soil salinity research institute in Karnal, they are working on to reduce the soil salinity through bio uh, these bio natural resource through resources, as well as we are working on an operational pilot project to reduce the water levels through subsurface drainage also. And now we have started working for uh, to explore more area, more options to to reduce the water levels through vertical drainage also. But the, these are all some in, in the initial stages. Although we right. have worked on extensive area and subsurface drainage, but we recently we have started this vertical drainage system also. Mm -hmm. And are you aware of other work going on around uh, India on in the same way? Uh, 
not so much sir that's why i have raised this question that we have a lot of area to uh -huh. share our to share the research studies which has been done abroad also and that's yeah. why because since it's a birthplace of uh, dr ranveer singh i would be happy if he can enlighten us on this area also yeah yes yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, I think that the drainage, uh, I mean, our state in the north, uh, Roger, they face both issues, declining groundwater level and rising water level. That's a typical uh, problem of uh, semi-arid areas, yeah. uh, given the groundwater system. So one of the, the big gap in my mind for our area is to characterize our groundwater system properly we are dealing with a black box. Mm -hmm. we, we don't know a lot about uh, how our groundwater system is uh, settings are in terms of uh, its hydrogeology and, and that hence how it behaves. We got a broad brush idea in my mind. I've been, I'm not actively uh, last 10 years working on that area, but uh, I have grown up uh, through the farm and the village and through the university system. So that's a, that's a big problem, like what we are dealing with, how, how much water is there, how it behaves, how long it's gonna last, how is quality changing. Uh, so yep. groundwater sustainability is a very big challenge for that area, yeah. Okay, uh, I see the note, we're going to close shortly. Um, if you wouldn't mind presenting the key points that have come out here. Yeah. Um, I would just finish with our Young Water Professionals project. We, we're currently training 20 young water professionals around India, um, and hopefully that will uh, help some of these research initiatives. So uh, some of those are in this uh, meeting, uh, 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 they're joining the meeting. So, yep. well, thank you everybody. Uh, it's disappointing not everybody joined, but that was a, a, a nice discussion that we had anyway. So thank you, thank you all. Shani is doing a Shani is doing a report back. Great, thank you. Uh, hi. Oh hi, Shami. Yeah, so for for the challenges and the opportunities, what we identified was uh, the solid waste and sewage released. This is for India, released into rivers, untreated and in high quantities. And there is limited research in the better treatment of the sewage and also limited efforts to decentralize the sewage collection system. And so we also talked about increasing research into the impact of the unlined drains because the drains that collect the sewage are unlined so what impact it could be having then to the environment. And then also the sewage, the sewage drains are also open. So they are breeding grounds to mosquitoes and other sorts of vectors. And then for the human waste recycling, we talked about the challenge of public acceptance of the products and increasing research in that, but then also like um, informing the communities and society that they're actually safe to use. Then there was a problem of river mining, which leads to erosion and silting of rivers. And all, another challenge was like, uh, sort of improper policy framework implementation. And there was a suggestion that if the policy frameworks that exist could be implemented in ways that enable research into soil and water health. And the other challenge was pollution from solid waste disposal sites. And for Australia, there's like an issue of, in cases of uh, uh, the natural disasters, for example, the floods and the pollution that happens from the waste, solid waste disposal sites. So the opportunities 
I've been I've mentioned some of them, but here just mainly captured the opportunities. There is we can we should have capacity built around the reuse of waste and self incorporation into the environment. And then also technological advancements in both soil management and environmental management and waste management. Then increasing like the society's accountability and participation in soil and water management. So here we could have like institutions specifically targeted at increasing people's accountability. And this is specifically to get people to own and care about the problems that are faced in soil and water management. So generally it was summed up in capacity, building capacity of society, building institutional capacities and building capacities in technical, technical capabilities. That was question number one. So question number two, sorry, I'm, I'm working, I'm speaking quickly. So question number two, the ways that could uh, research collaborations could be improved between Australia and India, there was uh, exchange of students, industry collaborations between Australia and India, and then also workshops and master classes. And here specifically, it was mentioned that you could document the process uh, in the workshops and in the master classes and share experiences so that every time you have a master class, you don't have to begin from the start. You can just keep building on what you already have. Then training of trainers, again, institutional capacity building came up, exchange of academics and researchers between the different institutions and countries, short courses, and then also increasing research dissemination to increase availability of research to communities. That's all. That's great, Shami. That's uh, that's quite a lot. So um, yeah. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. So we all did a good, we all did a good brainstorming, and you know, and somehow we all you know agreed to one point uh, that is you know, that you know solid waste management is something something this area which really need to be you know worked up at policy level. Uh, at uh, you know at a citizens level and also the corporate level so this has a huge scope certainly i think your group was i mean worked uh, quite in detail so i think the other groups if it is covered maybe not repeat but uh, just say the something different so we have some time for the panel discussion uh -huh. That's a good point thanks Bastard. um so could i please ask room number two now i think that might be, okay, you were in that room. Do you know who's reporting back for that one? Yes, I can report back. We had a bit of internet problem, so Anik uh, was not able to um, do that, but I took over. Um, so with respect to the first question, we had some suggestions that um, for the river health opportunities in the research, the assessment of environmental flows for non-perennial uh, rivers would be a very important point, finding new sources of flows and there. For the soil part, um, um, research on um, cropping patterns that should be regulated probably in, in terms of reducing nutrients, pesticides, um, to limit that, to basically improve the soil health um, uh, by regulating and diminishing or um, nutrients and pesticides. And then we also discussed um, uh, about the second questions and uh, there are indeed many um, institutes who are already doing something on um, training and research capacity building but often the people trained from those institutes was remarked do not have enough opportunity to apply their knowledge and expertise in project so actually there is a and point that there need to be more opportunities for them to apply their um, knowledge and expertise. Um, and 
um, maybe, maybe actually that belonged to the first question. In terms of the second question, more than um, the how do we initiate and sustain collaboration between the two countries? Networks was mentioned as a good um, uh, way of uh, keeping. Um, at going because one on one collaboration is always a bit um, um, dangerous in the sense of if it um, can be sustained, uh, uh, the collaboration. And the funding also for that was discussed. Maybe Department of Science and Technology uh, in India would be a good way to um, approach or leave it there. Thanks, Thanks. very much. Okay, that, that great contribution. Um, I think, Dharma, you were in room three. Oh, wonderful. <laughs> um, Your microphone is... Yes. Dharma, your microphone is on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I think there was an issue now. Yeah, can you hear me now? Yes. yes. Yeah, okay, sorry. Um, yeah, so the, the, we basically discussed only the first uh, the question. Um, I just highlighted some of the you know key points which were um, uh, sort of discussed. Uh, I think we had a very good uh, uh, you know discussion on the question question number one. Um, or uh, I think some of the uh, the points which were raised, like continuity of uh, you know the river elves, you know, they, it's uh, no point in uh, you know just uh, looking at a snapshot. Uh, how do we continue the, the, those uh, river health, uh, you know, management uh, for a long term? So there's uh, also the, the no point looking at five years, it's a 10 years or beyond is, uh, is the way to go. Um, also, there was some uh, discussion on uh, capacity building. In the capacity building, online training and, uh, you know, the uh, several short courses, uh, targeted uh, short courses. Uh, for the, you know the managing the wastewater, the recycling, and so on and so forth, um, would be would be a very good idea. That's a, that's a way to you know the build the capacity and uh, you know uh, provide planning for all, you know the, all the people who are involved. Uh, for India, it was also sort of as I said, the managerial managerial concepts development is uh, is very important. You know. Uh, to give a, a overall management uh, perspective uh, as far as the water and wastewater is concerned. Uh, smaller farms using lots of water, I think this is a particular issue in, in India. You know, you've got lots of farm, you know, the small farmers, uh, they use quite a bit of water. How do we make them more sustainable? Uh, wastewater, I think that we discussed quite a bit on the wastewater reuse. Um, I think there was a uh, you know, very good emphasis is on, you know, can we come up with, uh, you know, kind of some sort of, uh, you know, few case studies, uh, which uh, can be established both in Australia and India, and uh, that could become an example, you know, for, uh, for the work in this, in this particular area. So I think I'll leave that there. Um, and if anyone wants to add anything else, uh, please go ahead. Thanks very much, Dharma. Um, that's uh, that's great and fantastic. You were able to pull it together um, in that written format too. Um, could I please invite Roger to report back for room four or to nominate your reporter? And uh, sorry, Roger, you're also got your microphone off at the moment. There we go. Sorry, uh, uh, Dr. Singh from New Zealand is going to report for us. Wonderful. Thank you, Dr. Singh. Yeah. Thank you, Roger. Karen. So in our group, we, we discuss kind of what are the key uh, research issues uh, broadly. In the wastewater system, we talked, a, a number of groups talked about it, that wastewater is a key pressure on our river systems in both countries, in particularly in uh, India, and a number of suggestions are being made. But one of the suggestions we were thinking about the research into gray water systems, decentralized gray water systems within household or in the communities, how they can help to address the water demand and generation of wastewater, uh, that's sh something should be uh, uh, looked at. Uh, the, one of the key <coughs> issues that they, and we were kind of used the Northern India as a as a context for our discussion was the pressure on the rivers in terms of water withdrawal and then 
water use into agriculture, into a different industry. And we had this uh, twin problems into those areas, uh, rising groundwater levels, water logging and salinity in some areas and declining groundwater level into other areas. So how do we go about dealing with, the, with them? And I think one of the thing is a, a research focus on somehow to make the better use of monsoon water. And now our current system are designed in a way that we try to get rid of the monsoon water as soon as possible because it's caused flood and all sorts of issues. But that's a resource. That's a resource that the, we should look at uh, how we can make better use of that. And with the, the issue around groundwater quality and groundwater levels and this thing, one of the thing that the, comes to our discussion is that the groundwater systems in, in my, my view, and I think group who are supportive of that, is we are dealing with a black box in the Northern Indian system. We don't know what it is. We don't know how the settings are, how deep the water is, how much water is there, how it flows. And, and some research into that uh, and tools to understand that is quite important to manage that resource sustainably. So that's a, one area uh, we touched upon. The other one we did talk about uh, 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 water use efficiency or water productivity in uh, particularly in dairy production system. And I think the issue was coming uh, from like a we are looking at this diversification of products and systems into those areas. How efficient we can use water in them? What are the practices that can help to kind of regenerate the water system rather than degrade? And uh, uh, treat and reuse of uh, dairy water into the, the shed and that kind of research uh, into those uh, areas. We did talk about uh, uh, soil health like uh, soil health is quite a, a critical issues in my experience and opinion too. Uh, but question is really, how do we incentivize farmers, small farmers to do the practices that are good for soil health? As a farmer, I would like to keep on growing as much as crop I can because that's my income. Uh, probably not all good for soil. So how do we, uh, incentivize those things into the system is quite a, something to, to, to look at. Now, I will chip on a little bit my own view here, <laughs> uh, being from that area, born in to Northern India, close to Delhi, uh, being studied that system for a while. I think we have these issues of soil, water, low farmer income. Those are the kind of issues we are dealing in that part of the world. And I kind of, from a, being a hydrologist and uh, agriculture hydrologist point of view, think about doing this improvement and that improvement is a solution. But I'm kind of leading to a, a thinking that we need a system change. We need some diversification of some high value, low water footprint, low carbon footprint products and systems. What are those new systems? Looking then from the farm production to the processing to the marketing point of view, I think that's something uh, is an opportunity to collaborate and to, to look into between two, two places, uh, two countries. So that's, that's, a, that's kind of summary from, from us. I think that in terms of how we can facilitate that in addition to uh, what others have suggested, exchange joint research program, I think there is a need for sport to develop a good robust soil water systems, information systems uh, uh, to inform this management. And we should be uh, putting some effort into uh, exchange of those or sharing of those and further collaboratively developing them. Yeah, that's, I think that's pretty much we did discuss in group four. Thanks very much, um, Dr. Singh. That's really helpful. And um, yeah, great to get some ideas about some research collaboration there. Um, so thank you for that. I, I think I'm um, now going to hand over to Professor Basit Maheshwari again. He's going to introduce our Open Forum program and um, hopefully we'll get a chance for everyone to um, discuss some of the issues that arose during the breakouts um, after that session in the Q&A. So thanks. 
thank, thank you, Karen. And I know we are running over time, but I think it's important that we have this panel discussion and it has been very, very interesting discussion so far. And uh, so please bear with us a little bit over time, but uh, I think it's uh, really, we still have a good number of people there. So uh, we have two speakers and uh, have two panelists, but uh, for some reason, uh, Dr. Sasha Jenkins can't be here. And so we have Dr. Anupama Kumar. Uh, so I'd like to really very pleased to welcome her to this uh, workshop and thank you for coming over. And I'd like to introduce her. Dr. Kumar is the research team leader of the Environmental Protection and Technologies team at CSIRO, Land and Water, based in Adelaide. Uh, she has over 20 years of research experience in the field of environmental toxicology and risk assessment. She has developed, she develops and applies risk-based framework for identification and prioritization of contaminants. So it's a very important area for if you are looking at the water health or river health. And her current research has focused on making effective use of new approaches, approach methods to measure and characterize biological changes in response to emerging contaminants and in developing waste management guidelines and practices. So I'm really pleased, uh, Anupam Anupamaji, please uh, share your some thoughts. Thank you. Thank you, Vasanji. You have been very generous uh, with this uh, introduction. Um, yeah, so I have four minutes or so. So I'll try to summarize um, some of the key points and, and uh, even in today's discussion. Um, so before I start, uh, I would like to just say that I'm speaking from Adelaide, uh, the land of Ghana people. And I take this opportunity to pay my respect to their elders past, present and emerging. Let's always acknowledge the traditional owners of the country on which we live, work and learn because they offer so much and we need to know that the, some of those traditional ways of doing things are also critical and we need to merge them with the innovative uh, science. Uh, at CSIRO, I'm working, as uh, Basanji said, on contaminants, uh, effects uh, and measuring them, tracking them. I look at fish, frogs, dolphins, earthworms, plants and humans and look at the uh, wastewater management um, and develop uh, operating guidelines for reusing, recycling waste in agriculture, urban and industrial sectors. When uh, water quality issues, it's not that being a developed world, um, uh, there are no water quality issues. We do come across water quality issues in Australia. And uh, it's a clean green image, but we work continuously towards improving uh, the water quality status. Uh, due to drought, sometimes there is lesser water that concentrates contaminants in small pool of water. And then there are bushfires and then the runoff leading to flooding and that results in contaminants being released um, in the environment. I think our regulatory fr uh, framework is very uh, much in practice, probably I would say that, that the monitoring is done, the regulations are being followed and that makes it a little bit, uh, uh, it makes it more safer uh, and protects both human and ecosystem health. So I have an opportunity to work in India with CSIR, ICAR, IITs, universities, uh, and um, just uh, being in Australia and still I'm very passionate about working in India. So why India? Well, I'm Kumar, so that's one um, reasoning. The other reason is that when we look at these water quality issues, I've worked uh, with the scientists there and I have looked at um, water quality issues here. What I find is that when we monitor these environments, we find these contaminants at very low noise levels in Australia until and unless there is a kind of a spill situation that you would find at higher concentrations. While in India being such a large country and then as uh, um, you know, we are still kind of developing uh, and we have come a long way, but I'm talking from the last 10 years, 
uh, we would still see the untreated water being discharged into the rivers. And then some of the uh, industries are discharging into smaller creeks, not the rivers. And that gave us an opportunity to look at the problem uh, and understand the tipping point. So you, we are looking at problem here and the problem there, and then you compare them, that gives us a better understanding. And that's why it's very critical that we work together. And there are a lot of passionate people in this forum also have made great contributions and working in, in this area. And, and I think we learn from each other. That's the main thing. Uh, rivers are living things. And in, uh, in, in a world first, I think it was in New Zealand, river has been granted the same legal rights as a human being. So, so it's, it's, it's because the indigenous wanted, wanted to protect the value of the rivers. So they fought a case and said that we want to give it a living status and it happened. So in India, our rivers are, uh, to be, are protected based on the traditional values. So I think we need to find that right balance. And as Mishra Ji said, engineering solutions through infrastructure will not fix river health. And I think that's a very uh, important point. Uh, we need interdisciplinary teams and we have all of you here as a starting point, uh, hydrologists, soil scientists, computer scientists, and, and uh, all the biologists, toxicologists, uh, water uh, scientists, wastewater management scientists. But what we need is along with these regulators, which we have in this forum, but also industry representation. I think that's what sometimes we miss or we need to engage them a little bit more in such conversations and bring them up to speed uh, and let them know what is the benefit for them. Again, uh, water quality is a big issue. There are chemicals of emerging concern. I talk a lot about it and it will take a lot of time to discuss them, but, they, but just I can say that new chemical compounds are produced um, you know, at a rate of 10 million per year. So by the finish we discuss this forum, there will be thousand new uh, chemicals, you know, in the market. So um, chemicals are challenges because we don't know what to measure, when to measure, how to measure. Can we prioritize uh, 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 contaminant monitoring? I think there are bigger questions and through collaborative efforts and learning from each, each other using the land use mapping would help us to what to monitor. And there are some cutting edge technologies now that do not based on chemical analysis, which can be, be expensive. There are some bioanalytical tools that can be used. Uh, talking about end of pipe solutions, I think that's not the right way as Mishraji also pointed out. Tackle the source, not the symptom. So we can do a lot at the source level by segregating streams, treating them separately, not discharging them, reusing within the treatment. Uh, uh, and that way we can improve our ways and uh, stop the problem at source level. Now, there are micro uh, pollutants present in the treated wastewaters that are being used for irrigation. Uh, biosolids are uh, applied on land. But our work shows that some of these treated wastewater and the uh, biosolids, they contain micropollutants. And because the biosolids is rich in organic matter, they, the, 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 they may not be in the water, but they are bound to the biosolids. So we need to make sure that there are guidelines and frameworks for using uh, biosolids and uh, uh, so that we are not uh, we need to make sure that we are not recycling the problems uh, also. It may be uh, taking the problem from one end and moving it to other end. Uh, the other bigger problem is pharmaceuticals. Uh, we know we use them, we need to use them. And the, the, it is estimated that in 2030, probably the antimicrobial use would increase by 82% in India and 22% in the US. So this has led to antimicrobial resistance problem. And we can only deal with it by coordinated government, private sector, industry, uh, and uh, general public like working together. Uh, and here, the point is one health. I think we are talking about river health, but we need to know and soil health. But what about the integration of human health and the ecosystem health 
under one health approach as we are using from antimicrobial resistance is the way that will lead to a, a close coordination and a, a global uh, action to deal with it. Just quickly, I'll highlight a couple of other things like plastics. Plastics is an immense problem. I can talk about it for ages, but just would like to highlight that microplastics have been detected in human blood also. So the problems are really big. It's not an ecosystem or river health problem. Pesticide is a big issue as uh, Mishraji also highlighted. I think I would like to acknowledge here, Mishraji was very transparent and open about the challenges and the journey he has taken. We need to have such champions in, um, in um, you know, different uh, forums or even in countries at government level, because if we know the problem, then only we can tackle it. So um, uh, we used to come across like during my PhD days, I've seen fish kills in Australia, but we have come a long way through the regulatory framework best management uh, practices, and, uh, I, and I think it works. Evidence-based science also helps to change the behavior and the practices of rural communities. And Basanti has done a great job by sitting with farmers, talking about the issues. And I think pesticide is a big non-diffuse, uh, uh, non uh, you know, non-point source uh, issue, and it is becoming more uh, critical because we need to, India has to maintain access to international market. So there are regulations in EU and other countries for which for economic gain, we need to make sure that we Im uh, improve our practices. And quality science can make a big difference to the effectiveness and efficiency of environmental uh, regulation. Uh, in dealing with contaminants of emerging concern, it could be pharmaceutical, endocrine disrupting chemicals, personal care products, uh, like triposane in your toothpaste and in your shampoos, nanomaterials in our cosmetics, hydro, uh, hydraulic fracturing chemicals or fire fight, fighting forms. We have to work uh, nationally and uh, also internationally. Um, science, I think uh, I would like to say in the end that science communication is critical. As scientists, we have a responsibility to explain our research to even a 10 year old child. We have to make a difference at a grassroots levels. So there is one thing about science being published in general publications, high impact journals, but we need to think about the output and the outcome and the impact of that research. And that's the way the science is moving towards having that community practices and engagement to bring the change in the thinking and uh, I think uh, this will lead to better decisions by governments, industries, and communities. So at this stage, my main focus is research to policy and research to practice. These are the two main um, uh, drivers that I'm working on because you need to change the regulation, but you also need to make a change at a grassroots level. Uh, everyone highlighted Professor Singh, Professor Dunn, and Mishraji emphasize, uh, uh, you know, sustainable uh, SDGs uh, uh, related to soil and water. There was a discussion Professor Dunn mentioned about uh, monitoring. We need to understand and we need to be open and transparent about what we measure. We should share that information. It should not be, be sitting in the reports because that will give us a power to deal with the problem and protect our land and water and promote sustainable intensification of uh, our agriculture, industry, and urban sectors. In the end, um, we need long-term programs to connect, uh, maintain continuity. We talked about that in our special session and further develop indo oz network of experienced and young professionals. Uh, thank you for your attention. And uh, anumati is a word that's used in Ghana uh, for thank you. Thanks, bye. Thank you, Anuji. I think uh, you really, I, I commend your passion uh, about what you do and also the collaboration you have been developing with India. And uh, I think you rightly said uh, we need to work together and learn together. And I think that's what we are trying to do through these uh, yes. workshops in Australia India Institute and Australia India Water Center. And uh, uh, I think taking the science of river health or soil health to the community and 10-year child, I think if we can explain that, we've done the job. 
and that will have an impact. So uh, with this, thank you so much. Now we have, I think we'll have what 10 minutes or so for questions and comments. So the forum is open now. And I think Professor Bridget Singh is here. Are you there? Yes, Bhasan, I'm still here. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. So uh, please uh, either put your question in the chat box or just uh, speak. Uh, yeah, I agree with uh, Anuji that pesticides has been a big problem as uh, you know, uh, in other countries, the regulatory bodies come and spray the pesticide. Sometimes the farmers are not aware, not even knowing what pesticide has been sprayed. Uh, I have visited USA, Canada and many other countries. While in India, pesticides are in hands of the farmers. So as a result, there is multi-residue of pesticides being deposited in soil, as well as it leaches down and uh, to the groundwater, plus through lateral runoff to the rivers. So that is a big issue. I think a mega project can be formulated on that. And uh, authorities may be sensitized to regularize the use of pesticides through regulatory bodies. Maybe my proposal is that maybe Krishi Vigyan Kendras, you know, they can be made as a you know, regulatory authority. So this is one big point because large number of cancer cases are increasing in India. So this is a very big, big, serious problem. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, Tanuji, uh, uh, Mishra ji, do you want to comment or Anuji, do you want to comment? I think uh, Anuji has really brought uh, a lot of very, very pertinent um, uh, issues. And uh, as in our group also we discussed, the science communication becomes a very key thing. So what we do research, but at the same time, how we reach out to the community and then also convince them. So I think that is something which is very important. And also I think um, uh, one very important lead which she has given about health, because often see the rejuvenating a river or a basin actually reflects upon the civilization. So the health of ecosystem and health of civilization are linked. So I think rivers on their own are not polluted. So if we don't keep our house in order, then that will happen. So I think the linking the health of human and ultimately we should be able to demonstrate linking it with the human health. So if we can, we can do some work and then link it, perhaps it will help us in convincing the decision makers, not only at the high level, but the local level also to give importance to the best management. Because often, uh, I, I don't find there is a resource constraint, but there is a problem of priority. In many places, we will have problem, we will have resource at a state level also for infrastructure development. But, but, but when it comes to developing STPs for all the, all the towns, they will say that we don't have money and they will come to government of India. But, but the road projects and other projects, there will be a lot of resources available. So I think uh, linking this, this research, this dialogue, if we can link human health, ecosystem health, river health together, and then do a kind of good uh, uh, communication, scientific communication, that will, that will also be very useful. And as you said about, I mean, again, time is not there to talk about plastics and solid waste. I think Tanuji also has been talking continuously about uh, uh, that thing. Oh. I think that's again something which is very very critical to to look at and so at this stage i don't because we have already discussed quite a lot i don't want to again uh, repeat those points or try to support those points so uh, so i am quite in agreement with what uh, anupma ji has told and there, there is a lot to do together what i feel from the scientific community as well as policy makers from the both countries so I think a mechanism to should be developed how, I mean, already mechanism is there through your uh, uh, Australia, India Institute and then the water center, but maybe some, uh, some more specific uh, program is there, then we can perhaps uh, all get benefit out of it. Thank you. Uh, uh, any uh, I, would, I would like to just comment uh, two, three lines. I've been working in this field for the past 25 years on pesticides. 
And when we spray a pesticide, only 1% goes to the pest, rest goes into the atmosphere. And in view of, you know, in view of the cancer cases, the toxicity, the diseases increasing in India, I think an, uh, an effort at international level and with the help of Australian uh, connection, if a uh, recommendation, strong recommendation can go to the policy makers in India, like, you know, for, uh, uh, for giving pesticides in the hands of regulatory bodies and spraying pesticides only if the pest population goes above economic threshold level. Because farmers are not that educated. They want their crop to be, they are not aware. Complete cancer train is running from Patinda Punjab. So with folded hands, I would say this should be taken up as a priority matter. I, I think you're welcome to, when we have some seed grants, uh, you're welcome to develop a proposal and we can uh, all work together. Thank you. I'll, I'll just add a comment to it. Yes, uh, we have uh, been very um, active in this space to develop a project. We have done some training programs with rural women. We have even distributed masks, although it's just a mask but just to get the message across, the moment we gave those masks to these 250 women, their young boys or, you know, they came and they jumped and they took all those masks. So the message was there that you need to be uh, really be careful, remove your clothes. And then they would tell you horrific stories. So I think, I think it needs to be done. But one point there is a, let me be honest, this is a sensitive issue. And we need to work with the government, not create an alarmist approach. I think that's that I would like to say that in this forum, we can work together. But I think, yes, we are interested in human health, but monitor your water, monitor your soil and get the message across. We do yes. not have to go to human health, but yes. start with the environmental monitoring. And Rajiv, if you can facilitate that, like I'm, we should not go through, we know there is a problem, as I said, no alarmist approach. We develop a case study as it was discussed to show that it can reach water, it can reach soil, it can if, uh, get into food. And I think it will be a good way to then progress slowly because again, as Mishraji said, this is a long-term process. We need to change the behavior of the people and the practices of people. And Unko, they are more interested in uh, putting the food on their table because they are a small farmers. You know, we need to think about what are their barriers, why they are doing what they are doing. So I think it's, it's a... Anuji, Anuji, here I would say five of my projects have been rejected. They say we know that it is there. We will not sanction any monitoring project. Five of my projects have been rejected. They simply outrightly throw away my file, my projects. No monitoring project. There's nothing comes out of it. So it is the time is gone for monitoring. It has been proven internationally and nationally. We have to tap the doors of policy makers. It's like giving cigarette, don't drink it. What is it? You know, we are treating pests. So it is a, uh, it is a medicine for pests, but it has to be done at the proper regulatory level. Please, for God's sake, take it from the hands of the farmers, illiterate farmers. So uh, my all projects are rejected for monitoring at <laughs> national level. Thank and you. I can send you those rejection letters. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I think uh, I, you're so passionate. It's a great thing you are really championing this cause. Uh, Professor Brajesh Singh, uh, uh, your thoughts on how soil health relates to river health or water health? Uh, I guess uh, the everything, I think the, my, my last slide, that's what I... I was trying to say is that is if your soil is polluted, your water is polluted, your ecosystem will be polluted, ultimately that polluted your societies and then ultimately the health. A um, couple of things I want to point out, the per capita use of pesticides in India is quite low compared to any developed countries. Um, the problem isn't um, how much we use, the problem, it's my take is um, that it has been driven by the who sell them to the farmers. The farmers, he, we have regulatory frameworks. At my understanding, is a pretty good regulatory framework in India. It's about implementing that. That's where the challenge is, I think, in my opinion, is like. So farmer goes to uh, a, a shopkeeper that he have got a particular pest. He will sow the pest and farmer will give him 10 different types of pesticides to use and one of them to work. So 
I, I would what I would like to do is to, is, is to emphasize that the per capita any agrochemical, not just pesticide, is still quite low in India. That does not mean there is no need. I will agree there is a need for the regulations to be implemented properly. Um, and it can be done. I think there is infrastructure in India. India probably is the only country, at least on the paper, they have is, uh, uh, the ICR trainee or for the every district of the India. They can take some of those responsibility to advise farmer what pesticide to be used and when to be used and how much that to be used. So there is infrastructure. This is about having those discussions and making the sense out of that. Um, that can can help, I guess, um, to moving forward. Okay, thank okay. you. Uh, so I think uh, we are approaching the end of this session. So I I think we just take one minute each, and I, I would like to ask. Uh, uh, Rajiv Mishraji, uh, what has been the turning point in your um, what you have done through your work in Ganga rejuvenation? Just one example, one big learning point for you. This is a really difficult question because there have been so much learning while working with this river. I can tell you this, if you get attached with this, it, it actually changes you. So one typical learning point was some impossible projects, which was looking like Kanpur, perhaps uh, the success in Kanpur was a real turning point because no one thought that uh, things could improve in Kanpur. I mean, whether it is industry or seaways and all that. So if we could start doing some change that, that happened. And then another thing which I will tell you, the the, the faith of people in this uh, system and how you can actually convert that faith into responsibility. We did a lot of experiment. Time is not there to talk. But people have become, I mean, hundreds and thousands of people on their own, they go to the river and they start cleaning up or doing something for, for it. So I think uh, uh, having faith is perhaps the most important learning point that things can change. Thank you. Really very important point. Uh, coming to Brijeshi, what has been your uh, learning point in terms of soil health? So you have done a lot of high impact research and outcomes. What has been your thing? For me, it has been learning from the farmers, honestly. Um, we can do a lot of research, we can find a lot of things, but it's a farmers that have a real pulse of the, the Thank you. And Anuf Maji, what has been your, you have so many. For me, it has been that learning that the two-way communications, learn from them and then tell them what you know or you have discovered. Um, and, and, uh, and that's what's to make the systems to work. So for me, it has been the learning from the farming communities. Thank you. It's a very important point. Anuji. Yeah, for me, I would say that um, I think bringing the regulators or the policy makers and sitting with the industry partners and the researchers, because we need to understand, as I said, the, uh, the, uh, what are their limitations and what, what can be done. I think if you make these three stakeholders sitting together, looking at a problem so that the industry doesn't think that the regulator is against me and is creating a problem. And as a researcher or as a scientist, I feel this is my responsibility to connect them and develop that trust because that's the only way we will be able to change or make a difference uh, in uh, sustainable development. Thanks. Thank you so much. Uh, I think uh, you summarized very nicely. So uh, over to Karen now. Thank you, the uh, two speakers and uh, panelists. Uh, Really, it has been great. Yes, thanks everybody. Can I uh, add my thanks to the speakers for um, your insights and um, to our moderators and all our participants today. Um, the discussions sound really, really interesting and, and fruitful. Uh, I'd also like to uh, make special thanks to Mr. Rakesh Kasyap and Mr. Rajaram Purohit from the Jal Shakti Ministry for all their help in getting these workshops up and running. Um, I wanted to let you know that we're preparing a report for government on these workshops and our discussions throughout the, the four workshops um, part of the series. 
We'd like to include in that report some case studies of some of the bilateral research collaborations that you've got going on or that you're planning. So I'll be writing to you and inviting you to submit a case study. We'll either include it in the report, um, but all of the ones we receive we'll, we'll post on our Arch India website. And again, I encourage you to have a look at the archindia.org website. Um, so this really concludes the official part of the program. I hope to see many of you again next Thursday for our workshop on wastewater reuse management and sustainability. And that's a, that was a big topic in, um, in uh, today's discussions as well. Um, I also want to let you know that if you've been inspired today by uh, the discussions and you want to collaborate more with India or with Australia, um, and bearing in mind that we may have some um, funding announced later in the year to support those collaborations, then I'd like to invite you to stay on and join one of our, <coughs> excuse me, breakout networking rooms. So we've got three rooms. Um, they've got, uh, each will have a different topic area. So we've got one on soil health, one on river health, and one on water management for food security. They're open for the next 30 minutes, and they're for you. Uh, they're not for us anymore, they're for you to strike up a conversation with other researchers and water professionals and talk about your ideas for research collaboration. So we invite you to go into the rooms, um, the room of your choice. You'll, you'll see a pop-up on your screen. You need to scroll all the way down underneath the names to find the room titles and um, to select the room that you want to go into. And um, I, I hope in that room you'll find some other researchers. Um, talk about your idea, introduce yourself, talk about your ideas. So these are not uh, moderated sessions, they're for you, they're not recorded, they're for you to network and talk about your research. Um, and I suggest that if you're um, moving into the rooms, then please keep your camera on because it's all about connecting with the other people in the room. If you're having any problems, Please find the administrator in the chat and let them know what your problem is. So with that, um, let me thank our speakers and you participants again for sharing your experiences and expertise. And um, I'm closing the official program and announcing the opening of the networking room. So thanks everybody.